talk with you tonight a little bit about deliverance. And um, this uh, particular version of deliverance, I've, I've got a lot of material on this. John Wimber always told me, you do not want to be known as a deliverance minister. It will attract strange clientele who act strange. <laughs> Notwithstanding that, I've become known as a deliverance minister. And uh, if you get a chance to see the newer movie that succeeded the Jesus Revolution movie in its release, it was like a month later, uh, there's a newer movie out um, called, what is the thing called? I can't remember. Come Out in Jesus' Name. <laughs> that about tells you everything you need to know. Either that or it sounds like a police raid, right? Come out in the name of the law. Um, anyway, so uh, deliverance is exploding all over the planet, and especially in middle-class North American churches, it's exploding. Um, I'm not sure everybody's happy about this because deliverance can be messy, loud, um, off-putting to many, emotionally intense, um, all the things you're not supposed to do as a good middle-class citizen of America. But anyway, what is deliverance? Well, tonight we're going to talk about what it is, what it isn't, and why we need it. Those three things. That's what I propose to address with you. What it is, what it is not, and why we need it. So deliverance is increasingly necessary in the modern church as we move away from a society with a Christian worldview whose foundations and values are based on this book. And by the way, this has been going on uh, for many, many decades, indeed centuries. Uh, the secularization of Europe probably really hit its um, most ferocious point in the French Revolution which happened to be the same year that we signed our Constitution. So as America was being established as a constitutional republic based upon the Bible, that's why, at least for now, presidents still take the presidential oath on a Bible. Um, France was rejecting all of that, and in particular what they did was they took a prostitute off the streets of Paris, sat her on the high altar in Notre Dame Cathedral, and said, these are your gods. This literally happened. I'm not, this is not urban legend. You can verify this. And during the French Revolution, uh, there were more than 300,000 pastors and priests and what they used to call religious, so nuns and monks, people like that. More than 300,000 people were executed with the guillotine um, under, the, under the oversight of something, this is almost chillingly modern, called the Committee on Public Safety, led by a man named Robespierre. This is all fact check. I mean, there's no, this is not rabble-rousing. This is historically correct. And with that, Europe began to move away from the Christian civilization, what was known for um, over a millennium as Christendom, and uh, descended into, over time, uh, the secularized state that we see today. Today, in, in, in Europe, um, for a long time, England kind of held on, but in the last roughly 15 or 20 years, the whole thing just went off the cliff in England. Less than 1% of England attends church on Sunday now. Christian England, whose monarch is the head of the Church of England. Well, that's an interesting thing. That's left over from Henry VIII. I mean, a lot of these things move kind of slowly, but they do change over time. By the way, the about-to-be-coronated King Charles... Um, he's already king legally, but he hasn't had his coronation ceremony yet. He is a known necromancer and uh, somebody who consults with mediums and spiritualists all the time. So that's what you have as the head of the Church of England. Um, the, people, the percentage of the population who attends church in countries like Greece, evangelized by none other than the Apostle Paul, uh, Spain, France, um, just right on 1%. Germany, surprisingly, is the most Christianized of Western European nations at 5%, roughly, uh, maybe 4.9, I don't know, but it's right on 5%. And then you have in the, in the Eastern European nations, some that are still, I would say, clinging to faith. Poland is on that list, the Czech Republic, um, Moldova. But Moldova is a, 
in the scheme of world power, I, I don't mean to say that God doesn't love Moldovans, but in the scheme of world power, Moldova is an, is an afterthought. It's an insignificant country. It's small, has no real power, doesn't project power. It's just a member of the European Union, and it's, I think, the, the poorest country in Europe. So we've seen the secularization going on since 1789 with the French Revolution, and we've had our own version of it in the United States. Uh, the 20th century until World War II, America was still pretty Christian and, and pretty, uh, pretty devout. And this continued after the Second World War up until um, approximately 1967 when we had something known as the sexual revolution, which was really the leading edge of the rejection of Christianity in this country. And of course, in the aftermath of that, we're now 55 years away from that event. And by the way, why do I pick 1967? Because that was the year that the summer of love happened in this country, if you remember that. Woodstock in the east, and uh, I think it was the animals or the mamas and the papas had a song, when you come to San Francisco, be sure to wear the flowers in your hair. Well, this wasn't just a woman prettying herself with flowers. It was if you wore the flowers over your left ear, it meant I'm available for sex. Because we were, we were throwing off in this country um, the Christian morality that had governed the Western world since roughly the fall of Rome or maybe the, the very early Middle Ages. So pick the date you want, 410, 476, or maybe uh, the founding of the Benedictine Order in the 500s. But... Uh, that was really the, the morality and the, the sentiment around human sexuality that had, um, that had dominated. And for a long time, America was the shining light of Christianity as Europe went into eclipse. But even in America today, well, we have a revival underway, so this is going to change. But um, in America today right now, uh, the population percentage people who go to church is, is right around 40% overall, although in certain parts of the country it's much higher than that. That's offset by certain other parts of the country, like L.A. County, where only 2% of people attend church. So that gives you a little bit of the landscape. And I'm telling you all that because in a society that is moving away from Christianity, moving away from a Christian worldview, moving away from Christian ethics and Christian morals, in a society where, well anything goes, um, we now have a pluralistic scene where any and all religious persuasions are accepted. And during the time of Christianity's predominance in the West, and it was, again, over a thousand years, essentially the knowledge of uh, how to conduct deliverance, how to deal with demonic activity, it basically passed out of knowledge. It's not that it's not that there weren't still demons around, but much of what would drive and fuel demonic activity in society was pushed to the margins because nobody was, well, there just weren't saying necromancers around. People didn't go to seances. They knew it was wrong. If you wanted to visit a witch, you might find one, and it's almost a caricature, but she probably did live deep in the forest in some kind of a you know, hut or something, and you had to walk a ways to get there. Of course, they didn't have cars and highways to get you out there. <clears throat> so you might, you know, you might go into the forest and meet with this witch, and she would do whatever she did, give you a potion or maybe a poisoned apple. But, uh, you know, whatever that was, uh, that with, with so little activity going on because the church held such a, such a sway over society, and by the way, let me just say, that was not entirely good. It was mostly good, but it wasn't entirely good. Because sometimes when anything gets predominant control, it, it, it's almost like monopolistic behavior in economics. Abusive things begin to happen. And we need to acknowledge that. That, that was a reality. But anyway, um, <clears throat> there just wasn't much demand for you know, witches' services and demonic stuff, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what's going on with my voice. Um, by the 19th century, essentially nobody knew how to cast out demons. And this is why a book that you might want to get and read, it's kind of an interesting book, called Bloomheart's Battle. 
It describes a 19th century German pastor, a Lutheran, of course, and he had battles with demons in a young woman in his church, and he didn't know what to do, and he didn't know where to go, and nobody knew what to do. Of course, he was Lutheran, so he wasn't just going to go down to the local Catholic church and ask them about it. The Catholic church had retained the right of exorcism for centuries, but even for them, they weren't really doing very much of this because, again, a lot of the stuff that would give rise to demonic activity had effectively been pushed to the margins of society or driven out completely. And so Bloomhart's Battle was a noteworthy book precisely because this kind of thing had become unusual by the 19th century. And that may have been caused by, as I've already suggested, greater conformity to living according to God's ways and consequently a lower rate of demonic incursion. Put into normal English, fewer people were demonized because fewer people were sinning in ways that would give entry to demons. Um, there was a reduced ability to recognize demonic activity by Christians, and so they weren't trained to deal with them. That was Bloomhart's problem, and that's why he struggled to get this young woman free. And today, anyone in any kind of frontline ministry is likely to run into uh, somebody who needs deliverance uh, maybe as soon as tonight. Because it's really everywhere and it's exploding, and that's why you've gotten this new movie come out in Jesus' name. Does anyone here know the name Catherine Crick? Wow, what a different demographic. Okay, a couple of you. So, um, man, if I said that in a lot of other churches I go to, every hand in the room would go up. But uh, Catherine Crick is a young woman. I think she's in her early 30s. She, um, she lives in the L.A. area, but she's traveling everywhere, and she's doing deliverance meetings in parks and open halls and things like that. People are coming because of the need that they have. And there are others that are doing this as well. I'm just mentioning, uh, come out in Jesus' name, features a pastor out of Nashville, Tennessee, named Greg Locke. And then, uh, and then I mention her. But there, there are others that are kind of newer people on the scene. Me, I've been doing this forever. <laughs> uh, learned it from John and Blaine Cook and Becky Cook and some other old line people. Um, had some training a little bit with Francis McNutt. So, um, but I don't, I don't play the social media game as well as I should. And so uh, people may or may not have heard of me. But um, I have a lot of experience doing this, uh, accumulated over many decades. When we talk about deliverance ministry, we have to talk about the word daimonizomai. It's a Greek word, and it's, uh, it's technically known as a deponent verb, so it appears to be um, a passive verb, but it's actually not. That may not mean anything to you, but if you're a Greek scholar, it would. So this word daimonizomai means demonized, not demon-possessed, but when the King James Bible was translated in 1611, 412 years ago, the translators of the King James Bible rendered this Greek word as demon-possessed, but the very nature of the Greek language and the very use of this word daimonizomai means a sliding scale of demonic control, you could say oppression if you want to, um, but that idea of possessed was a holdover from the way people viewed things in the Middle Ages. And of course, in 1611, that was the tail end of the Middle Ages. By the way, for reference, does anyone know when the Massachusetts Bay Colony was founded in Massachusetts by the Pilgrim Fathers of America? 1620, that's right. There was, uh, there was one settlement as well in Virginia in 1607 known as Jamestown. Jamestown is still there, but the settlement is not. So the King James Bible basically comes into being about the same time that America is being starting to be settled by Europeans, as we say, settled. I know even saying that, some would consider it racist, but uh, the bottom line is Europe was coming to America. And so uh, basically the King James Bible brackets most of the modern period, roughly half a millennium, not quite all of that, 412 years, but, but essentially a half millennium, it brackets that entire time frame. And so the language of demon-possessed becomes commonplace 
because of the influence of the King James Bible. And up until the early 20th century, there was no other translation that you would likely be using. There were a few of them around, but they were hard to find and nobody really read them. So it became known as well as the authorized version, authorized by King James himself, King James I. And, uh, and it, it basically became the language set that defined everything we know of in much of Christianity, including this area of deliverance. So as a result of that, when more modern translations came about, translations like the Revised Standard Version, which was, which was widely used not in churches like the Vineyard, not in churches like, I don't know, the Renewal Stream churches, Bethel or uh, Harvest International Ministries, HIM, HROC down in Pasadena, not in churches like that so much, uh, but in churches more with names like First Lutheran Church, Third Baptist Church, uh, the First Presbyterian Church, the uh, Second Congregational Church, um, the Episcopal Church, anything like that, um, the Revised Standard Version comes into uh, play in the mid-20th century, which is, well, getting near to be 100 years ago now. It's kind of hard to think about, but it's, it's, it's nearer to that than not. And um, the evangelical world kind of rejected it, and the mainstream... Uh, what we used to call WASP churches, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, they adopted the <laughs> what became known kind of sarcastically as the reviled slandered version. Um, <laughs> by the way, can I ask everyone, please silence your phones completely, 100%. If, you, if you're expecting an important text or something, leave it on vibrate so you'll know that it comes in when it does, but otherwise, can we have them silent? So... Um, Anyway, and then, then there were other translations that came along. We kind of had a, a burgeoning of translation activity in the latter 20th century. The New International Version came out, also known as Necessary in Vineyard. And so uh, that became the go-to translation in this movement. Uh, and there were some others. I've got one here. This is the English Standard Version. It came into being in the early years of the 21st century. But anyway, most of these translations were attempting to stay as close as they could to the original language of the King James, getting rid of the these, thys, and thous, and, um, and updating uh, so that we didn't have strange phrases like, or, or clauses like, uh, is there flavor in the slime of a purslane? <laughs> Who knows what that means, right? Unless you are an Elizabethan English scholar, or you take some time to read a dictionary and sort that out. So what they did was they were trying to uh, retain the language of the King James with as many of the introductory remarks in the first few pages of your Bible might say, with uh, the soaring beauty and mellifluous turns of phrase. And so the language of demon-possessed continues, even at this time, to linger in our Bibles uh, nearly all of them. Now, this English Standard Version, one of the things I like about it is that even though it does use the term demon-possessed, it footnotes it, and it says, Greek word diamond needs a my, uh, meaning oppressed by or controlled by spirits, but it, it moves away from that idea of possession. This is a really big stick point for a lot of evangelicals because they say, well, if you belong to the Lord, how can you belong to the devil? Because demon-possessed implies that a demon owns you. And that if we understand possession not as ownership, but rather perhaps domination, uh, just like, you know, Germany dominated uh, or possessed Poland after the start of the Second World War, uh, you would have about the right idea. But most of us don't spend that much time thinking about the nuances of language. And so even at this date, even now, and you know, quarter of the way through the 21st century, hard to believe. I remember when 2000 came and we all thought the world was coming to an end because of Y2K, right? Um, in fact, we were at Mike and Shai's that for that particular New Year's. Anyway, um, so diamondizomai continues to be a misunderstood term. And I've, I've taken the time here and belabored it a bit to help you understand this word. What does it really mean? Well, it's a sliding scale. At the low end, uh, the, the demons may harass you, they may bother you. Uh, at the kind of middle range, they might 
um, have a greater measure of control and even drop thoughts into your mind. And if you don't resist them, they might vocalize through your own mouth. At the high end, they might control you much of the time and express their evil desires through you. Demons have will. They have intellect. They have emotions. They have appetites and lusts. And this is the primary reason that deliverance is not inner healing. It is not sozo. It is not Emmanuel prayer. It is not RTF. It is absolutely not the same thing. And yet everywhere I go, I hear people say, deliverance and inner healing are interchangeable. False. 100% false. Because when you're dealing with inner healing, as we were discussing this afternoon, you are dealing with the broken soul, and you are dealing with the individual. You're dealing with that individual's emotions, their memories, and possibly their will, which may have been corrupted. That's what you're fixing in inner healing. You're, you're bringing healing to the inner life of that individual. When you're dealing with deliverance, on the other hand, you're dealing with a third-party intruder with its own will, with its own intelligence, with its own desires, and it should not even be there. It is a trespasser. And so when we deal with deliverance, we are evicting something that shouldn't be there. We are not trying to heal anything. Now, we might be healing the soul in the aftermath, but, but deliverance is eviction, and inner healing is fixing the soul with no eviction. Does that make sense? And a lot of people don't clearly understand that, probably in, in the vineyard and probably in this particular vineyard, because Ray does some of this kind of ministry, he would have explained this to anyone who attends here, but some of you are visitors and guests, and no one's ever explained this to you. So <clears throat> when we're talking about integrated healing, we're ministering to the entire person. Sicknesses of any kind, they may be mental illnesses, they may be physical illnesses, whatever they may be, caused by demonic influence, they can have or exhibit uh, some or all of the symptoms of other categories we've already described, like spiritual sickness or emotional or mental sickness or physical sickness. And so healing this kind of sickness means the expulsion of the demonic influence and the restoration of the areas that were affected by that evil spirit. And so John Wimber used to say, he's been dead a long time now too, um, in November of this year, it'll be 26 years since his home going. So, you know, his voice, while very significant, is becoming dim. There are many vineyard people who don't even know who John Wimber was, and there are many who don't walk in his ways uh, within the modern vineyard. Um, and although his books were popular in the day, all of them are out of print. So unless you happen to buy a used copy or have one on your shelf from years ago, you know, there, there are not a lot of voices out there that are trying to clarify these things. But anyway, we're trying to do that tonight. So um, there are the affected areas. And John used to say, when somebody has an evil spirit, evicting the evil spirit is the least of the trouble. Because once that demon is gone, only then can the healing process begin. And oftentimes people who have had demonic activity in their lives need a period of recovery. They need a period of rebuilding. They may need to learn entirely new social skills. If, for example, they were um, in need of social healing. What do we mean by social healing? Well, sometimes people just live with a spirit of rejection. And the very behaviors that they undertake, everything they do pushes people away. It's, it's offensive. It creates, it drives rejection in their life. So you might drive out that spirit of rejection, but now they have to learn how to behave in such a way that they don't uh, continue fostering that kind of rejection in their own life experience. Or think of somebody who may, I, this, was gonna, this might offend a few, but I'm sorry, Think of somebody who gets freed of a transgender spirit that's causing them to want to change their, their sexual identity. Well, if they've already had some sort of activity in that direction, whether through the use of hormones or perhaps uh, surgery to remove certain body parts or create others, 
you're not just going to see that instantaneously change. There might be an opportunity for reconstructive therapy or surgery, but you know, you're talking a couple of years probably to move through that entire cycle. And in some cases, the damage has been done in the body in such a way that they'll never be quite all the same as they once would have been. And so when we think about that, we realize that demonization is really the enemy's attempt to destroy somebody's life at the deepest level possible. So expulsion, demon expulsion, deliverance, is not the same thing as exorcism. Exorcism is a series of scripted prayers, and there are well-known rituals within particularly the Roman church, but the Orthodox church has them as well. And uh, the Anglican church kind of keeps it under wraps. It's not in the Book of Common Prayer, but they, they do this because it's, for them, uncommon, so therefore it shouldn't be in the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, but there, there is a way, a mechanism for dealing with this within Anglicanism because it's still within that sacramental tradition of the church. Uh, a lot of the more mainstream Protestant churches, like the Lutherans, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and more, I certainly am not trying to single them out, I'm just giving you an example of what I mean by that term. Uh, a lot of them have absolutely no space for this at all. They don't know what to do with it. They don't have it in their books of order or whatever. It, when things go bad, they call somebody else. <laughs> Ghostbusters, who are you going to call? <laughs> but exorcism is a series of pre-scripted prayers, and it may use very, very ritual-based, ritualistic uh, activity, like the presentation of a cross to the demonized person, or anointing them with oil, or bringing in the consecrated host which is believed to be the body of Christ, and laying it on the, the person with the idea that the demons will recoil from the body of Christ and they will flee. Um, whether it's effective or not is its own conversation, but anyway, this is how they do it in that end of the church. So expulsion, in contrast to that, is really driving out demons by the authority that we carry as new creatures in Christ. And I made mention earlier today about this restoration that God wants to bring and that we have a place below God but above the demons, and so we assert the authority that is ours because of him uh, in driving those demons out. That's a very different approach from the um, rite and ritual-based approach that exorcism brings that is sacramental. So healing of the demonized through deliverance uh, can be controversial depending on where it goes on. And there, there would be many churches, even at this time, that although probably many of their people need deliverance, they wouldn't be open to it in the least. And yet, it's a growing phenomenon. So we're going to look at some case studies before we discuss how to, how to engage in deliverance, how to deal with it. And I'll just say this, some of the common hindrances that could be in your own mind about it are number one, poor models. There, there was this hideous movie that came out, I think it was around 15 years ago, called The Apostle. And it was about a man who lived in a trailer at the end of a dirt road in Arkansas. And the, the storyline unfolds that a mother brings her daughter to the apostle for help. And um, let's just say he has his way with her. And unfortunately, because it was a Hollywood movie, have his way with her means in every way you could imagine have your way with a young girl, even though he's supposed to be a man of the cloth. And so um, we see those kinds of poor models. I've seen examples when I've been in China and India where we're in a normal room, might even look a lot like this one because you know even the developing world is fairly developed at this point, especially in the cities. And so it might look a lot like University Vineyard, and somebody manifests a demon, and I don't even know where these, they get this stuff. I mean, I don't see this you know, stacked up against the wall, but suddenly somebody's got a big length of chain, or they've got a big bamboo pole, like a big thick one, and they're beating the victim, trying to get the demons to come out. Well, you see that, it's pretty off-putting. And because of exactly that kind of behavior, in the nation of Australia, I have a lot of familiarity with it because I spent about a decade of my life going there six, seven, eight times a year and uh, essentially being involved in a huge revival that broke out in that nation. Um, 
In the nation of Australia, they have seven states versus our 50, and in five of them it is illegal to perform exorcism. It is illegal under Australian law for churches to conduct exorcisms. Now, they didn't write deliverance in there, so we kind of skirted through all that. But, uh, but that's there because those kinds of abuses have happened in recent memory. So there can be poor modeling. Um, in certain times of, of world history, uh, maybe they didn't use lengths of chain or a pole, uh, but they might have put people in what they called the ducking stool. Now, the ducking stool, really that's an older way of saying dunking stool, and they would strap somebody in and they would put them under water. And if they survived, it was proof that they were demon-possessed, which was the language they were using. It was proof that they were demon-possessed because the demons helped them survive being ducked under the water. And so they would pull them out and burn them at the stake to, because they were demon-possessed. And if they didn't survive, it was proof that they weren't demon-possessed, and praise God, now they're there with Jesus. It was, I mean, it's, it's a really perverse logic, I'll grant you, and you know, you're all laughing kind of, you know, oh my gosh. But, but unfortunately, this is when I made, you nodded in particular, uh, when I made the comment that it's not always entirely good when you have a monopolistic position in, in the thought of a society, but this sort of thing emerged in Christianized societies, and it should have never gone on. It, it's easy for us to look at it now and say this is absurd and condemn it, but for a long time that wasn't the case. All right, the second reason that there are hindrances is worldview. It's often viewed to believe in demons is viewed as medieval. It's viewed as um, very backward. And even today, um, the, we have a fascination in American society with the paranormal, and it's growing. The, the movies that are being released through the theaters prove that this is a growing fascination. And yet, let me just say this. If you walk into um, Fine Tower at Princeton University where I attended college, this is the headquarters of the math and physics uh, departments of Princeton. God help you if you mention that you believe in demons. Because what they're thinking about is like elementary particles and how far is it uh, it's from here to whichever star they've identified with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this idea of demons is nowhere in their vernacular. You will be either driven out or laughed out, but you will not be given one moment of genuine consideration with anything that you might have to say. And so, depending on where you are in society, there may be more or less issues with the worldview that allows for evil spirits. Why do we believe in them? Well, we believe in them because they're in the Bible, and uh, it, it says explicitly that Jesus drove many demons out of people. We also happen to believe in them because we run into them a lot, and we know that they're real by experience. But without the Bible, we might find ways of dismissing all that. So the Bible tells us what is real, and then we experience reality because it gives us a proper lens with which to see. All right, and then the third reason is there are theological beliefs that state Christians cannot be demonized. And, uh, and that will stop a lot of people. Anna's nodding her head because um, her most recent roommate, uh, one of many, I think, not roommates, but friends, uh, basically hold this point of view. And so while they have many problems in their lives, they literally cannot get help because if we try to minister deliverance to them, they immediately shut it off. And so uh, Maria's nodding her head. You've run into this more than once, apparently. And so people can say that Christians can't be demonized. Well, if we move away from the possession language, it gets easier. And if we understand that thinking about the human system, we've got the spirit in the center, the human spirit, which becomes filled with the Holy Spirit. Then we've got the soul with memories, emotions, and will. And then we've got the body. Well, you can't have an evil spirit in the human spirit because the Holy Spirit will be there in a believer in the, in the human spirit. But in a non-believer, there's no Holy Spirit there. So yeah, they could be demonized even in their spirit, in their, in their core of who they are. But the fact that the Holy Spirit may be in the human spirit doesn't mean that, that there can't be evil spirits in the emotions or the memories or in the will or in the body. There are places in Scripture where it is explicitly asserted 
that people had physical maladies because of the impact, influence of evil spirits demonizing that part of them. So this is how it occurs for those who may be stumbling over that idea that Christians can't have evil spirits. I agree that a, that a born-again Christian cannot have an evil spirit in their spirit man or spirit woman. I agree with that. But you can have them afflicting your soul or your body, even as a believer. All right, so a fourth reason is there's teaching out there that it was all done at the cross. And with that, many people believe that whatever evil spirits you may have had, they all left at the moment of conversion. Well, all you need to do is work in a church for about a week. <laughs> and you don't have to be on the payroll, by the way. You could just be a volunteer working in the Sunday school these days, right? Used to be we thought of kids as pretty innocent and don't have all these issues. But we have literally sown to the wind and we are reaping the whirlwind. And so even our young children, ages four and five, are having demonic activity in their lives. It might be as simple as a nightmare or you know, night terrors, but it might be far more serious than that. I got a call not too long ago from somebody who had a five-year-old that was vocalizing in multiple languages in a deep, gruff voice and that could pick up the bed with one hand. And they wanted to know what to do. And I said, well, your child needs deliverance. Well, that can't be. It was all done at the cross. I said, well, then I don't know what to tell you. Because th this is the solution you need. And if you tell me it's off limits, then I, I don't know what, you know, call the local psychiatrist or get them medicated. I, I don't, this is what we're doing, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Okay. So... A fifth reason is there's theological snobbery. Well, this is, you see what Pentecostals do. Those uneducated people from the south side of the tracks. And so we, we take the theological high road and mock our brothers and sisters who actually on this point have it far more in hand than we might. And then there are cultural associations that make it unacceptable in many churches. Um, this is what the lower class do. It's similar to the Pentecostal argument, but um, I remember hearing somebody say something to the effect that the great unwashed that come to us from the third world are the ones who believe this, but we who have been living in America know better. Well, there's so much racism and cultural overtone in that that we hardly dare comment on it. But anyway, there you go. So deliverance does have an evangelistic use. It can be very powerful. Catherine Crick is using it evangelistically. She'll go into city parks. She'll set up her little you know, outdoor speaker and start preaching, and people come, and uh, they, get, they get delivered in her meetings. Most people in America today, right now anyway, are not using deliverance evangelistically, although if you see Come Out in Jesus' Name, Greg Locke has done that in a large tent that he erected for tent revivals. So it does have an evangelistic use, and we'll look at that in just a moment from Scripture. Um, but the greater use that is chiefly as a pastoral tool, and it's part of the process of sanctification, becoming wholesome and holy uh, through the power of the risen Jesus. So let's look at some uh, case studies from Scripture. We're going to start in Mark chapter 1, and this is, uh, we're going to go to verse 21. And it says this, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Now, by the way, if you go to Israel today, you can go into this synagogue. It's there. They rebuilt the upper part of it in the 4th century. Um, so it's like a complete remodel, tear down and rebuild of a house. But the foundations that were there when Jesus was alive are still there in the ground. So, you know, sometimes just going to these places kind of grounds these stories in reality. They stop being myth and legend. And as I like to say with some of this stuff, if you don't see it going on in your life, pretty soon it becomes legend, and then legend becomes myth, and myth becomes unreality. It never happened at all. And that's really the, the progress. I don't really think it's progress, but that's the progression of that kind of um, thinking that can go on in our modern world. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Why did they view him as having authority? Because he would say to them, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. 
Whereas the scribe said, well, Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Shammai said this, and they would quote these various uh, commentators. When I went to seminary, that was a big part of how we were taught to preach. We were taught to do all the research and all the commentaries to know who the kind of leading voices were in our time. Maybe if we really wanted to impress somebody, we'd pull out something from St. Thomas Aquinas or St. Augustine. But we were basically quoting commentaries over and over and over and saying, well, this person says that, and this person says that, and this is how you should live. And it became a moralizing effort. Um, and you're nodding vigorously, so you've, you've sat in these churches. It became a moralizing effort um, to get people to behave. But, but mostly what we did was we quoted one another. I had to unlearn a lot of that as I started to move into the supernatural, as I began learning about the kingdom of God as I worked with John Wimber. It's not that I think commentaries have no value, but I will say the, the value is often very limited, and especially with modern commentaries, they're so analytical, they, they are just going after the, the, like the parsing of Greek verbs or, or tenses, and similarly in Hebrew, and they're, they're so caught up in this uh, social critical approach that they don't really understand the world of the Spirit. They don't, they don't teach what you need to know. So I'll, I'll check in with these commentaries just to kind of frame my thinking and be sure that I'm not off base with the, the baseline research. But, but really, the Scripture is meant to be read organically, and that's why Jesus would take passages out of the Old Testament and he would bring them to life with a, what seemed to be a, a new slant or a new spin on it. And of course, the fact that you're doing that doesn't mean anybody should listen to you. But when demons start popping out while you're doing that, suddenly that gets everybody's attention. And so <clears throat> they were astonished because he taught with authority, not as the scribes. And immediately, at that moment, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now, that synagogue in Capernaum is probably the total square footage is smaller than this room. It's configured a little differently. It's a perfect rectangle, but it's probably smaller than this room. So, you know, anybody could see what was going on. And he cried out, this man with the unclean spirit. Now, by the way, the fact that it's called an unclean spirit is itself important. And it's, and it's something that's vital for us to understand some of the keys to breakthrough in modern deliverance ministry. So why is it called an unclean spirit? Well, because it's unclean, but that doesn't really tell you anything. That's a tautology. It's called an unclean spirit because whatever it was, that specific spirit, and there are different unclean spirits in the Bible beyond that one, but whatever that was, it was unclean under the laws of Moses. There's no other way that a Jewish person would have understood that. And so what's happening is demonization is coming in because some important part of, I'm going to say, the moral law of Moses was being violated. Now I'm giving you an, an extremely important point on deliverance in this, so really pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. In the law of Moses, there are three parts, three parts, and it is commonly accepted among Christians that we don't have to worry about the law of Moses. We don't have to worry about the Old Testament. That's all Old Testament. I've heard so many people dismissively treat the Old Testament that way, but let me tell you, in most of the history of the church, if you were to make a comment like that, you would be excommunicated. And the reason you'd be excommunicated is even as late as the Reformation, roughly 1517, even as late as that, most people understood that the Old Testament was inspired and there were lessons in it to be learned. Now everybody understood that you didn't have to follow the sacrificial system because there was no temple in which to sacrifice. And in any case, the book of Hebrews tells us that there remains no further sacrifice to be made. The sacrifice of Jesus was enough. That's true. So we don't have to worry about all of the rules and regulations that govern how you sacrifice animals or how you run the temple. But I will say this. There are some very interesting things, even in things, uh, books like Leviticus or Numbers, that tell you something about God's sentiments about things. 
that you might not get anywhere else in the Scripture. It's kind of weird to be talking about this in public, but here we go. We are talking about demonization. So I'll give you an example of what I mean with that statement. In the book of Leviticus, there is an entire chapter, chapter 15, if you want to fact check this later, that deals with the emission of semen from the male body. And it says that this renders the man unclean um, until he performs a sacrifice to be made clean. Well, one of the big debates that you always hear when anyone's talking about modern sexuality in today's environment is whether masturbation is okay. And there are a lot of people who want to say it's okay. Well, if it's okay, why then in Leviticus 15 did they have to bring an offering for the uncleanness that was brought upon them when they masturbated? It's really quiet in here. That's a mic drop, isn't it? So even though it's the ceremonial law, there are still very important lessons that can be taken out of it, and this is why we read the totality of Scripture. I don't know that you want to preach that on a Sunday morning. I'm not even sure you wanted to preach it on a Saturday night in a seminar. But it's exemplary of the kinds of things that are still learnable even if we don't have to follow that piece of the law. And again, there is no temple, and even if there were, we wouldn't need to sacrifice as Christians. But I assure you, in the Jewish community, there is a very active group within the Orthodox sub-segment of Judaism, and they have everything necessary to be able to erect and reinitiate the sacrificial system in Israel within nine months of the word go. Yes. So there are people who still think about that but we aren't among them because, again, the book of Hebrews makes it clear that the blood of goats and bulls could never fully su suffice. Now we have the blood of Jesus. All right, that takes care of the sacrificial part of the law. The next part is the civic part of the law. So ceremonial civic is part two. Ceremonial was part one. The civic part of the law is how do you run a nation? What are the laws that deal with things like theft and if people you know, break each other's property, and this is sprinkled through the Mosaic Code. Well, old Israel isn't modern Israel. It's on the same piece of property, maybe, but, but it, these are two very different societies and civilizations. But it's interesting, when Israel was reconstituted as a state in 1948, a modern ma nation state at the end of the Second World War, is my battery dying? It sounds like I'm not as loud as I was. Am I coming through the speakers? If I am, then we'll just keep going. Okay. So um, when Israel was reconstituted, they took as much of what they could out of the Old Testament at the request of the Orthodox, and they incorporated it into the legal codes of the modern nation state of Israel. But we don't live in Israel. We don't have to follow those laws. There might be some wisdom in them, though. For example, laws of retribution. If you damage somebody's ox you need to replace the ox. Well, if you hit somebody's car, maybe you need to pay for that. So again, there's wisdom in this, in this material, even if it's not implemented to the, to the letter. All right, then there's the third part, the moral codes. Now, the moral codes of the law deal with a whole range of issues from, well, incest and sexual behavior on down to a number of other things. And the moral codes of the Old Testament law, very interestingly, if you look in the parts of Paul's letters, remember, Paul's a rabbi, if you look in the parts of Paul's letters that deal with how should Christians live, you know, he says the fruits of the, the, the flesh are obvious, and he talks about things like you know, divisiveness or lust or whatever, and then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, there is no need for a law when you're living in that because you're not living in the other. But, what, but in the things that he says, you shouldn't do this, you should stop doing this, it's always at the back end of the book. So the last part of Colossians, the last part of Ephesians, the last part of First and Second Thessalonians, and more, Galatians, etc., Romans. If you go to the latter parts of those books, what you'll see is Paul is recapitulating the very instructions that are in the Mosaic Code that deal with moral living. Said another way, 
if we believe that Paul is inspired, if we believe that his letters are authoritative, and you should, because that's why they're in the Bible, then that part of the Mosaic law apparently didn't go away. And this is why Jesus would say, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not. I have come to fulfill them. And this, by the way, is why big parts of the law he left uncommented on, because he was basically saying the way you're managing these is perfectly correct. It's these other areas, your business with Corban and certain other things that you've, you've changed and you've drifted away from what the true intent of the law was. This is what I want to say to you. You have heard it said, do it this way, but I say unto you, let me bring you back to what the original intention of that law is. By the way, since it's come up a few times and it came up in our conversation with the youth this afternoon, um, with respect specifically to homosexuality, one of the big arguments that you will hear people make is, Jesus never commented on homosexuality, so it must be okay. Wrong. It's clearly forbidden in the Old Testament code, multiple places. And so the reason he doesn't comment on it is everybody in old Israel at his day, 2,000 years ago, they knew it was wrong, and they were enforcing that part of the law correctly. And so he didn't need to fix it. He came as a reformer. He didn't need to comment on it. That is the right answer to those people who say, Jesus didn't comment and it doesn't matter. The, the, real, the real correct answer is, yes, that's because 1,500 years before Moses had put it in the Mosaic Code, and it was right then, and it remained right at the time of Jesus, and it remains right for us today. Does that make sense? All right, all of that came out of the one word, unclean. <laughs> so this man in the synagogue, he has an unclean spirit, and he's unclean because of whatever it is that's in Moses. Now, it doesn't tell us specifically what this man was into or had been into or whatever, but that's why it's an unclean spirit. And so this expulsion um, goes this way. As Jesus is in the synagogue, this man with the unclean spirit cries out, and he says, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him, or throwing him into convulsions, and crying out with a loud voice, Aah! That's a loud voice. Sometimes we read this stuff and we don't actually let it sink in what it means. It came out, and they were all amazed, so they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? Well, remember, they said he taught with authority. So they're amazed by the authority, but also even the unclean spirits obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Word travels fast, whether or not you have Twitter. So this expulsion occurred in public, right in the Jewish synagogue. What would our modern equivalent be? The church. Because the synagogue was the kind of precursor to the church, and they morphed that Jewish form when establishing congregations throughout the world as the church was going forth and being planted. There doesn't seem to have been a particular symptom of demonization in this man. It might have been obvious to everybody there, but the Bible doesn't tell us what that was. He was apparently, at least on some level, just like every other ordinary person attending the synagogue that morning. <laughs> just lightening things up. All right. Um, that particular Sabbath day, the authority of Jesus was present, and to everyone's amazement, the demon manifested, and it came out shouting out loud. Now, there is this thing I'm going to talk about right here, because we are here, um, that is commonly being taught in many parts of the church called quiet deliverance. And under this belief, um, you know, we basically invoke our great authority that we've been given, and we have been given great authority, but we invoke that authority and we command the spirits to leave, and when we do that, they leave silently because we commanded them to be silent. That's the basic line of teaching, and I know many churches where that is presented 
as a rational thought. So here we have the story of Jesus. Jesus says, be silent. Is it, does he not say that? He does say that. And come out of him. And so the unclean spirit immediately shut up and said nothing. No, it threw the man into a convulsion. <laughs> and it cried out with a loud voice. Apparently, Jesus didn't get the memo about our great authority. <laughs> but you see, it's said twice in this passage, he had great authority. So great authority gives you the ability to drive these spirits out, but usually when there's evil spirits, there will be some sort of manifestation. Now that manifestation can vary quite widely, and sometimes it is louder and sometimes it is quieter. Sometimes even I've cast demons out of people, and this seems to occur most commonly for reasons I don't understand, um, on the continent of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, because north of the Sahara, they're Arab, and south of the Sahara, they're, they're Negroid. Um, by the way, that's not a bad word. It's just a description of a racial group. And I didn't use the other N word. And I'm, I, you have to say this nowadays or people trigger and react. So, and, and there's a difference in those two groups of people. Their hair is different, their skin tone is different. By the way, one isn't better than the other. God loves them all. It, it's just simply that there are blacks, there are whites, there are brown-skinned people, there are yellow-skinned people, and there are red-skinned people. But basically five big buckets of races in the world. So um, anyway, in Africa, below the Sahara Desert, in what we might call tropical Africa or savanna Africa, if we move down towards the southern end of the continent, sometimes when you drive demons out of people, there isn't a big manifestation. I don't really know why. I just, I've run into it, so I know that it's, it's a thing. Uh, but they will tell you they can feel the demons leaving, often through their fingers or through their knees, through their toes. So now and then there is a quieter form of deliverance. But note, even with that, at least the individual who was demonized recognizes that there is change going on, and they recognize that something is happening. All right, so... Um, the authority of Jesus is present, this demon manifests, it shouts out loud, it even speaks, taking control of the vocal apparatus. So if we understand this sliding scale of demonization, when demons start to vocalize, this is kind of in the four to six range on a 10 scale, or higher, could be higher, but, but generally it's in the kind of that mid-field, and the one, two, three level demonization, rarely do demons vocalize. But they could project thoughts into the person's mind and that person might speak out what is coming into their mind, not as their own thought, but as demonic projected thoughts. That is real. So if somebody is speaking out at the one, two, three level, it's because they are articulating what has been put into their head by the evil spirits. So this demon speaks out, it challenges Jesus, but it acknowledges his identity, and by extension, therefore, obviously, his authority, that's in verse 24, and Jesus silences it, commanding it to come out. It does come out, and it is ultimately silent, but it is not silent initially. Um, and so we have these convulsions and these loud shrieks, but it leaves without harming the man. So the, the salient feature of all this is the authority of Jesus, and word spreads all around, causing many more people to come to him seeking deliverance. And I can tell you firsthand you start casting out demons and people will come from everywhere. I mean, I could, I could probably minister to people 200 hours a week when every week only has 168 hours. And at some point you just have to kind of shut it off because you got to brush your teeth. You need to sleep. You need to you know, pay the bills or whatever it is. And we see this dynamic in Jesus' life. It says uh, that people were looking for him and he would sometimes avoid the crowds. In fact, here we go, just after uh, this event, the entire crowd, uh, town gathers, and they come seeking help, and it says, he healed many and they, who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, Mark 1, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, obviously he was a young itinerant preacher, <laughs> right? He died at roughly age 30, so... Um, 
I can tell you, when I've had a long, late night of ministry, I do not rise very early. I, I want every moment of sleep I can get. But rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon, Shimon in proper Hebrew, and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said, everyone is looking for you. And he said, let's get out of here. Let's, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. So this is really the extension of the kingdom ministry. But when you have an authentic, viable ministry where people are finding freedom, they will come from everywhere. And as I said, I could stay busy 200 hours a week if I wanted to do just praying for people to be delivered. All right, let's go to the next story. This one we're going to look at Mark chapter 9. And uh, in Mark chapter 9, we have a story of a boy. Now, Jesus has been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And in verse 14, it says, When they came to the disciples, meaning the other nine, because Peter, James, and John had been with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Now, you're having a bad hair day in the ministry when you are in an argument with the scribes. Because these are the guys who know literally every letter of the text, and they're the ones who are responsible for reproducing more manuscripts, and you know they compare things, and they're the ones who are safeguarded with keeping the tradition. So we've got the nine apostles. Who's among them? Well, Peter's brother Andrew is among them. We've got Bartholomew. We've got Thaddeus. We've got Judas, who isn't a bad guy yet. Right, so we've got, some, we've got some pretty legit apostles here, and they're in this great argument with the scribes. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, they were greatly amazed, and they ran up to him and greeted him. So they've been gathered around watching the argument between the scribes and the apostles. And I can imagine what that conversation was like. The scribes are quoting whatever piece of the scripture they think is the relevant one to be quoting, and the apostles are saying, we were given authority by Jesus. And they're probably saying, by what authority are you doing this? I've literally had somebody say that to me once upon a time. I told this story last night to somebody who was here. Um, and so that's, that's a thing, especially in that part of the world. So they're probably watching this argument between the apostles and the scribes. But now Jesus comes along, and they recognize that it's him. He might have even had some fading glory on him from being on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses did. And so they bail on that conversation. Forget these guys. Let's run over and see what he's going to do. And so they come running up to him, and he asks the nine apostles who are arguing with the scribes, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd shouted out. He answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. All right, so now we know what the argument's about. We don't know what piece of the scripture they're arguing about, but it's about this deliverance that failed. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. <clears throat> and he answered them, not the Father, not him, them. Every word in the Bible is inspired. We need to pay attention to the detail or we will miss the story. When I was a boy, I heard this passage preached on more than once, and it was always, Jesus is rebuking the Father. No, he isn't. He answered them, not him. That's what the text says. We need to stay with what the text says. So he responds to them. Who's the them? The nine apostles. That's who he's talking to. And so he answers them, oh, faithless generation. Well, there's your, there's your annual review right there. <laughs> oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. What's he doing? <laughs> you guys, I gave you authority when I sent you out. I told you you had authority over all the power of the evil one, and you failed. And by the way, I've just been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. As soon as we finish this crusade and close it up, I'm heading south to Jerusalem, and I will never come back until I am raised from the dead. So you better figure it out because you're running out of time. That's what he's really saying to them in modern English. It sounds a little more harsh the way I'm saying it, but this is pretty harsh when you call your disciples a faithless generation. All right, so they bring the boy to him in response to what he says. And when the Spirit saw him, immediately 
it convulsed him, or it threw him into a convulsion. And he fell on the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. So it's an early onset thing, but apparently he wasn't born with this one. Sometimes people are coming out of the womb with an evil spirit. And it has often cast him into fire and into water, seeking to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. Why is he in unbelief? Because he's been to the nine apostles and they've failed to bring it in. Bring it in. And so with that, he's like, man, I hope you can do it because you're the last stop on the line. Right After this, the train stops running. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, so again, not a quiet deliverance, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer, and some of the older manuscripts say fasting. So you, what he's really telling them is, men, you've been riding on my coattails long enough. I gave you authority, and you took it for granted. Instead of developing your own depth of spirituality so that when you come up against a spirit like this, you actually have something in you to drive it out. And so again, he's rebuking them. He's giving them a, you know, a bad annual review on their performance as apostles. So let's unpack it a little more. The scene has these nine apostles unable to cast the evil spirit out of the boy. And this leads to a controversy um, with the scribes. All right. The father brought the son to Jesus and his disciples for healing, so he clearly had faith. He believed something would happen, or he'd heard about him. Remember, word went out everywhere, and so he would heard about him. He's like, maybe this is the answer to my problem. What were the symptoms of this demonization? Well, the boy became, we could say, a lunatic or epileptic, something like that. Um, there's some language about this in Matthew 17, 15, which is a parallel account to this. He was robbed of speech. He becomes mute. Um, when the demon periodically seized control of the boy, it caused violent convulsions with a view of killing him, whether by throwing him into the fire that he would be burned to death or throwing him into the water that he would be drowned. So this demon was not in control all the time. And for people who have evil spirits, this is a common phenomenon. Sometimes they're just perfectly normal, and we don't even know what's going on with that. Is the demon just quiet and kind of laying low inside of the individual or on top of them or something? Or are they not there at all and they come back and return home? It's not always clear which one it is. But what we do know is many times demonization is episodic. But when the demon is manifesting, then all hell breaks loose. So now this boy is being affected in every way, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, and socially. Every single one of those dimensions is affected by this demonization. And I can tell you, just from experience, that when we run into people who have evil spirits, their spiritual life is usually somehow degraded or, or I don't know, held back. Um, there may be emotional problems. And a lot of times people who have emotional, what we call emotional problems, they have an evil spirit there. And when that evil spirit leaves, the emotional problems clear up. Mental problems, all right, physically and socially. And I can only imagine a boy of, it doesn't say how old he is, but he's a boy, so he's, he's probably what we would call school age. Imagine the bullying and the hazing and harassing that he goes through because bullying is a phenomenon in every society of the world. It's not just something that we have in America. Jesus severely upbraided the disciples for their unbelief. I pointed that out. And his later explanation uh, for this outburst and their inability to drive out the demon was that this particular kind of spirit comes only out by, by concentrated periods of prayer and 
fasting on top of it when necessary. But it's the presence of Jesus that caused the demon to manifest. Again, it's the authority that he carries. But, you know, he's given us that authority. And it comes and goes in my life, but I've had many meetings where in the middle of teaching and preaching, people just start manifesting, and that's kind of the end of the sermon right there. And we just go to dealing with what's going on. All right, so... Um, when these demons begin manifesting... In this case, it's an epileptic convulsion, or what seems to be an epileptic convulsion. It may not have actually been epilepsy. Um, that can be a diversionary tactic to dif dissipate faith. So for people who don't really understand what's going on, they can become frightened, run out of the room, etc. And so, you know, I like being in Latin America when demons manifest because everybody jumps to their feet and says, Gloria a Dios, glory to God. <laughs> Except in, in a few churches I've been in, that are, you know, really infected with the evangelical mindset of North America, uh, that have had a lot of that kind of teaching. And by the way, on that point, um, some maybe it was seven or eight years ago now, uh, I went to Taiwan and I went to a church where it was a large multi-staff church and um, many people in that congregation, I don't remember the size now, but it was a, it was a big church. And, uh, we, the, I mean, demons started popping out everywhere. It was like Groundhog Day. And the staff afterwards said to me, and they all spoke good English, uh, they said to me, you know, you are teaching and preaching about this the way we used to believe, and we all left Taiwan for a period of time and attended North American seminaries with names like Fuller and Gordon Conwell and Trinity. And they told us there that we needed to let go of our superstitious beliefs and so when we came back, there were no more demonic manifestations, and we didn't have any deliverance ministry, and yet our people got worse and worse and worse in the problems that they had. And he said, you walk in, you treat the Bible like it's to be taken at face value, and demons are busting out everywhere. We had one night where literally more than 500 people were delivered in one fell swoop, and the entire place was just covered in vomit and plastic bags, but, but it was good. It was actually really good. But they were excited, and they're trying to figure out how come this stuff doesn't work. And the answer is it doesn't work for you because your minds are filled with unbelief. The very thing that these apostles, these nine apostles, who had been left at the bottom of the mountain, were themselves dealing with. And I'll tell you this. This, ma this mindset is prevalent throughout North America in many churches. All right, so... <clears throat> Fear can come up, those standing around fall into a spectator mentality. What we really want is people who are like, right, the fight's on, let's go get them. So Jesus questioned the Father, how long has this been going on? He apparently got words of knowledge because a few verses later he says, you deaf and mute spirit. But he didn't have a word of knowledge about the source of this. Now this is important for a lot of you who think you need to be operating in 100% revelation 100% of the time to be used by God. You don't. I've got a friend down in Orange County. He claims he's never had a word of knowledge in his life. I don't know if that's true, but that's his claim. But he's used all the time in deliverance, and so you don't have to be in a continuous flow of revelation, and Jesus wasn't in a continuous flow of revelation. Um, Jesus once again reiterates the importance of faith. He says to the Father, everything is possible to him who believes. And when the Father's faith is faltering, Jesus just ends the thing, and drives the demon out. Now, this, this deliverance was done in, I would say, semi-privacy, but not complete privacy, because this crowd is running together, and so he's trying to shut down the spectator crowd dynamic, but there are some present as this thing happens. So a lot of times people say deliverance should only be done in private. I don't agree. But I do think we need to protect people's privacy. So if it, if it happens to occur in a room like this one, Probably what's going to happen is I'm going to be down on the floor next to them with my hands cupped over their ear, driving the demons out, so that the only person who knows what I'm really talking about is the person whose ear I am speaking into. Depending on the particulars, sometimes it might be a little more public, but usually not. So I'll just say this as maybe a corrective thing. In the vineyard tradition, 
it's almost reflexive. Somebody manifests, drag them out of the room, do it in another room. I don't think that needs to be the case. And I think it's actually better for people to observe that demons are coming out because it is proof that the kingdom of God is at work among us. Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then you know with certainty the kingdom has come among you. How are we going to know the kingdom has come among us if every time anything happens, we just drag the person out of the room? And that's what I like about those societies like Latin America, maybe in Taiwan that night, uh, where, where deliverance happens this way. It lets people know this is, what, this, is, this is really going on. This is really working. And I think it's why Catherine Crick got 2,000 people in Melbourne because most of the churches in Melbourne, Australia, especially after three years of COVID, they aren't talking about deliverance. They aren't doing deliverance. Ain't nothing going on. And people want to know more than anything, they want to know God is real. That is the number one thing people want to know. And right behind it, does he care about me and my problem? Well, this father had that same problem. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Well, Jesus sorts it out, and now he knows. God cares about him and his son. All right, so it's relative privacy, but it's not complete privacy. But what we're trying to avoid is um, excess emotion, maybe a spectator mentality, um, dissipating faith, unhealthy interest in the devil and all that he does. And because human beings are carnal, maybe even gloating over the boy's calamity, that would be a violation of his dignity. So we want to be sure to keep people's dignity intact. All right, um, he expelled the demon by rebuking it. He commanded it to leave and never to return. Sometimes demons will put up a battle. We see this, for example, a couple of chapters before this in Mark 5 when Jesus is dealing with the man who lived in the graveyard. He's usually known as the Gadarene demoniac because he lived in the region of Gadara. But he lived in a graveyard. And it says, it's very clear in Greek, and only the better translations in English render it as an imperfect tense verb. But an imperfect tense means repeated action in the past. Jesus kept on saying to that, that demonized man and the cluster of demons in him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Over and over again, he was saying, come out, come out, come out, you unclean spirit, come out, come out, come out. And maybe because there are so many, he switches tactics. He gets the name of the ruling spirit, Legion, and with that, using that one name, he drives all the whole lot of them out, and they go into the pigs and are drowned. So demons will, at times, battle back and forth. Again, those who claim that we have this incredible authority and they can't possibly resist us actually don't know what they're talking about, and it's, it's usually an indication that they have very little experience in deliverance. Now, the majority of the time, we prevail quickly. But depending on what's there, if they've been grounded into witchcraft, or uh, one time when I was in Uganda, they brought some kids that had been in Kanye's army. And I don't mean the, the rap singer here in the US. I mean the guy, it's, it's said the same way, but spelled differently. There was a guy who had an army of children. And he had, he had you know, given them guns and made them fight on the front lines. As part of inducting them into his army, they were forced to kill their own parents. And then they had nowhere to go. So Kanye becomes the beloved leader. That language might sound familiar to those of you who are familiar with, say, North Korean politics. And so um, anyway, they brought these kids for deliverance. And I will tell you, as somebody who's done a lot of deliverance and who had fasted a lot before those meetings, we got them all out. But it wasn't like instantaneous, just one and done kind of stuff. Because those demons were cemented in. They were anchored in or welded in by virtue of the bloodshed that, they'd, that they, these kids had been involved with, murdering their own parents, number one, violating one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, right? Unclean spirits. Remember what I said about the Mosaic Code. So we got that one. Then we got all the murder and mayhem they'd, they'd been conducting in the countryside as they marched through Kenya with Kanye's army. Well, so sometimes they will put up a battle. Other times they come out more easily. And apparently, this deliverance with this boy was exhausting and traumatic, and that's why he appeared to be dead, but Jesus raises him up off the ground, and he comes too. All right, the last story we're going to look at is found in Acts chapter 8. I mentioned the evangelistic use of deliverance. And so in this story, um, we have had the martyrdom of St. Stephen, and so the disciples have scattered. They've hit the road. They're, it's too hot to handle in Jerusalem. 
And Jesus did say, when they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. So it's not like they're cowards. They're just doing what Jesus said is prudent. All right, so um, Acts 8, 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word, which you might argue was a hazardous undertaking in this setting because, of course, Stephen has just been martyred for preaching the gospel. But they were carrying out the commands of Jesus. So they're preaching the word, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now this is really the coming of the gospel to Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. Why are they paying attention? Because of the signs. It's not just because of the word. They're listening to the word, but the signs validate the preaching of the word. This is why we need these things in the church. It lets the world around us know that we aren't blowing smoke, because everybody else is. And what were the signs that they saw? For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, so no quiet deliverance in Samaria, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Well, so was it that the demons were causing paralysis and lameness? The language seems to indicate that, but you could also read it that maybe there was deliverance and there were dramatic healings going on that were not deliverance. But there are many times I've seen people with severe physical conditions, the way they get healed is through deliverance. So that is a thing. And there was much joy in that city. All right, so the story is short, and we pretty well commented on it as we went through it, so we don't need to go through it again. Now, having read these three stories, and there are other deliverance stories we could have looked at, but we picked these three because they, they work for what we're trying to explain. Here is what deliverance is. Number one, deliverance is power encounter. Jesus said, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, this should lead us to ask an important question. What is the finger of God? And the finger of God, this language occurs only a few times in Scripture. The very first place we see it is in the scribing of the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets which God gave to Moses. And then later, after Moses broke the first set, when he brings a new set up on the mountain, God writes on the new stone tablets, which Moses had, had chiseled out, carved out, the Ten Commandments once again. So when we talk about the finger of God, this is inextricably linked to the law. Oh, hmm, what about that argument that nothing matters in the Old Testament? Better rethink that one. And I will tell you, I've seen, I've learned that the Ten Commandments safeguard some of the most dangerous things in the universe that a human being can get into. And so oftentimes when we talk about people getting delivered, we are, we're right in there in the center of stuff like adultery or murder or dishonoring your parents in whichever way you did it, or there are some others on there, but you get the idea. If I drive out demons by the finger of God, then you know with certainty the kingdom of God has come among you. So what is the finger of God? The finger of God is the written word combined with the express power of the Holy Spirit. That is the finger of God. And that's how Jesus did it. That's why an essential part of his ministry was to update the law, to bring them back to the foundations that they never should have lost. And then again, the things he didn't need to comment, he just didn't comment on. Paul picks up this very idea with his own ministry. And remember, of course, Paul had a deliverance ministry. We know that in particular in Ephesus, many demons were driven out of the believers there um, in the wake of the revival that came. So there was like wave one where they got born again, and then there was wave two where they had a deliverance revival. And it says those who were now believers, they came and they brought their amulets and their scrolls and their charms, and they had a big bonfire, and they burned it all, and it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. That, by the way, is about 23 years' worth of wages. So whatever you make, multiply that by 23, and that'll give you some idea of what that might have been worth. So in the wake of all of that, 
And again, Paul's a deliverance minister just as Jesus is, and we know that um, Peter was involved in this as well, and I presume the other apostles. Certainly the extra-biblical accounts suggest that all of them were busy driving out demons in their ministries beyond the time of the book of Acts um, as they went to countries like Iran or uh, modern-day Armenia, etc. Um, they were busy with deliverance ministry. But Paul puts it this way, my message and my preaching weren't with words of human wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. So the finger of God is this overt, express power manifested in and on people, in addition to using the word of God to delineate what might be the very problem that needs deliverance. Number two, deliverance is the expulsion of demons, literally pushing them out. Now, how many people here know the name Lou Engel? Okay, so Lou Engel's famous for the call, the send. Um, he doesn't run the send, but he works with them. And nowadays he's doing communion revival. But Lou has made a lot of the Greek word ekbalo. And when he uses it, He's talking about, Lord, ekbalo workers into the harvest. Thrust them out. Send workers into the harvest. Lord, would you ekbalo people? That's what Lou is all about with that word. The same word is used for the driving out of demons. Thrust them out. Drive them out. So when demons are driven out, because they generally don't want to leave, they like the hosts that they have, there is commonly some kind of a manifestation, as I already said, and it is commonly not absolutely silent. It may not always be shrieking and crying, but you'll hear people, huh, or, <coughs> in fact, today, this morning, when we were doing that inner healing exercise around mother wounds, there was someone sitting right over here who was being touched by the Lord, and pretty soon they started coughing. Now, that wasn't particularly offensive or anything, but the fact that they were coughing, I almost called it out, but I thought, now we're doing inner healing, let's not go there right now. But you could see in that very manifestation the integrated nature, ministering to the whole person, as Ray asked me to speak about. As that person was getting some inner healing, the demons that were tied to all of that brokenness in the memories and the emotions, they were shaking loose and they were coming out with at least a sound, even if it wasn't shrieking. All right, third point, deliverance is the most overt sign of the inbreaking kingdom of God. And so in a church that is kind of in decline, deliverance is the first thing to leave when the Holy Spirit lifts from a church. It's the first thing to stop happening. And when that church kind of gets back in the swing of things through revival, it will usually be the last thing to return. Now that may or may not be good news to you, but, but it, it's reality. And the other thing about deliverance, because it is the most overt sign of the inbreaking kingdom of God, the other thing about deliverance is that when deliverance is what you need, nothing else will do. You cannot substitute inner healing for deliverance. You can't even substitute healing of sin sickness for deliverance. They often go side by side, I'll grant you that, but they are not at all the same thing. You can't substitute Bible, Bible memory, Bible reading, communion taking, baptism, confession. None of that's the same thing as deliverance. There's one and only one thing that is deliverance, and it is, the, it is literally the ejection, the forcing out of evil spirits because it is a third-party intruder that should not be there. All of these other things that I've just named, baptism, communion, Bible reading, these all deal with our own internal spiritual life. It's not dealing with a hitchhiker. So when we talk about deliverance, it's an overt sign that the kingdom is broken in. Now, I'm just looking at the time. I thought I had set my timer when I started, and I apparently did not. So I'm pretty sure I'm over what I wanted to do. I'll try to wrap this up, but let's, let's finish this out. Here's what deliverance is not. Deliverance is not exorcism. Now, I already talked about the right of exorcism. I'll just say this. Jesus cast out demons with a word using the authority and the power of God. So deliverance relies on the power of the Holy Spirit rather than on ritual. And so a lot of times people say, give me a deliverance prayer. What should I pray? Well, I can give you language, 
but I would far rather that you understand your authority and use your own language than that you just copycat words that Ken Fish gave you on a piece of paper or a text message or however I get it into your hands. But there are whole books out there that people are publishing on deliverance prayers. I want to suggest to you, you don't need those books. What you do need is to understand your authority. You do need to understand this dynamic of what they attach to. You do need to understand why some parts of the Old Testament still have relevance for these things. And with that, you can drive those demons out. So, um, I already said this too, but I'll just restate it. Demon expulsion isn't the end of the therapeutic process. It's the beginning of the therapeutic process. Once the demons have been evicted, the restorative process can begin. But until they are removed or driven out, ultimate and complete healing will not occur. And here's why. Demons are kind of like, they're kind of like a bulletproof vest that police wear. So when there's, a, when there's a demonic presence in place, it's almost like you can fire at that thing as much as you want. I guess if you get a big enough gun, you might get through the bulletproof vest. But generally, the ballistic vests that police wear are designed to withstand pretty high-powered rounds. Um, so the force of the prayers that you are praying. People say, well, the Holy Spirit's more powerful than the demons. He is, but depending on where you are in your own level of consecration and anointing, kind of like the apostles that we looked at in Mark 9, you might find that you're using a substandard caliber for the level of armor plate you're trying to get through. And if you want to stay with that kind of a metaphor, then what fasting and concerted prayer will do is it will upgrade you from a 9 millimeter round to a 50 BMG or a 20 millimeter light armor piercing, and you'll punch through that armor plate. That's exactly what you're doing. And so this is why people who have evil spirits in place, many times they don't get healed. Or if they do, they lose the healing nearly immediately because whatever that spirit was, it's still in place. And as soon as the, uh, the incoming rounds stop, again, extending the metaphor, as soon as that happens, what occurs is the demons just go back to doing exactly what they were doing because they weren't driven out. And so that is your answer to a lot of these healings that fail. And if it, isn't, if it isn't deliverance that didn't get done thoroughly, maybe it's inner healing that didn't get done thoroughly. So that might be, by the way, why you were having pain when you woke up this morning. We didn't get all the way to the bottom of the tank, but we'll have another go at it. So this is how we think about these problems. Number two, here's what deliverance is not. Deliverance is not dealing with New York Times demons. Now, usually when I say that, people laugh. You guys aren't very funny people. But um, this is what a New York Times demon is. <clears throat> New York Times demons are the ones that are referenced in an article or maybe in an obituary that says, well, with just a little bit more Prozac and some counseling, he or she would have been fine. It's a shame that she didn't get the psychological help that, that she needed. And so the entire paradigm is that this is all about psychology. And I will tell you, the majority of mainstream waspy type churches, if you read any of their material, all of them, in their Bible commenting, uh, in their preaching, um, in their uh, uh, pastoral care manuals, on and on, all they talk about is how demons are just psychological problems. That is absolutely not the case. They are not New York Times demons. And it is not true that with just a little bit more Prozac, life would have been fine. Biblical demons are irrever irreversibly and irretrievably, irredeemably evil. They have personalities and appetites of their own, independent of the person they inhabit or afflict. And this is why they will put into them or on them desires for things like pornography or sex with animals or murder or whatever it might be. There's a whole host of things that they might do, but that is what they are. That is what they do. They are seeking to give expression to that. So they have a will, or as we might say, a mind of their own. They aren't merely perturbations of the human consciousness. Neither are they extensions of a wounded or broken soul. That's a point I've already made. The third thing about deliverance, what it is not, is it is not self-deliverance. Now, there's a lot of teaching out there on how you can deliver yourself from evil spirits. But deliverance, as we've already noted, is when a person is in bondage and is seeking freedom. 
Now, because Anastasia is visiting us, we have a standing family tradition. I call it the mandatory Disneyland visit. Whenever one of our children comes home, we must go to Disneyland for a whole day. And uh, so we're going to go to Disneyland on Monday. In Disneyland, there's a ride called Pirates of the Caribbean. You might have been on it. Well, in Pirates of the Caribbean, there's a particular scene where the pirates have come into the city and the city's burning. And there's, uh, you're, you know, you're on your little boat and you're kind of going through the ride. And as you come around right over here on the right, there's a jail cell and there's three guys in it. And there's a dog just outside the jail cell and he's got a key ring that he's holding in his mouth. And the one guy has a bone and he's holding it out through the bars and he's going, <whistles> how do I know that exact meter and tune? Because we go to Disneyland a lot in my family. All right, so <whistles> what are they trying to do? They're trying to get out of prison and they can't get out of prison. Why? because they're locked in. That's what demons do. They lock people into prisons that they cannot escape on their own. The very nature of deliverance in Spanish, what do they call it, Maria? Liberación. We're going to liberate people. We are setting captives free. And by definition, if you're a captive, you're held in bonds of some kind. Maybe it's a jail cell, maybe it's handcuffs, but you normally can't get out of that. I know sometimes people jailbreak, fair enough. But most of the time, that's not a thing. And so the very notion of self-deliverance is rooted in the ideas of people who don't practice it and don't really know what it's about, or they wouldn't even be teaching it. Now, can God deliver people sovereignly? Yeah, he can, and he does. But it's not the majority of the time. Most deliverance occurs at the hands of believers ministering to other believers. This is why... Jesus said, when he sent out the uh, first the 12 and later the 72, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. He did not say to them, teach people to cast demons out of themselves. Otherwise, maybe there'd be a, you know, a book of Jesus. It'd be a tract that got incorporated into the Gospels. Here's how Jesus told them to teach people to self-deliver. No, he was driving out demons and they were watching him do it, and they adopted his practices, and they had his authority, and because of that, they were successful in deliverance ministry. That's how it actually works. So I don't teach self-deliverance, don't really believe in it. Every now and then, I'll hear a story from somebody who will say, well, I was, you know, whatever in my home, reading my Bible, and I felt like the Lord told me to rebuke something, and I felt it leave me. Praise God. I view that as a subcategory of self-deliverance. But the vast majority of deliverance that goes on in the world is because believers are casting demons out of those who are afflicted. So, <clears throat> in addition to everything I've just said, I'll just put icing on the cake, there is not one single story or model of self-deliverance anywhere in the Scriptures. Not a one. I defy you to find it and bring it to me. I'll change what I'm saying and admit that I'm wrong if you can find it, but I know you won't. So since it's not in the Bible, why are we teaching it as a go-to technique? Because like with so many other things in modern Christianity, we're not rooted in the Scriptures and we're not thinking the, along the pathways of the Scriptures. The Scripture says, I run in the pathways of your commands. Well, to run in his pathways means to do it the way he did it, to walk in the paths that he walked. All right, the last thing, and I've already said this one, deliverance isn't just an extension of inner healing or healing of memories or sozo or RTF or Emmanuel prayer or some of these other techniques. It evicts a third-party presence that shouldn't be present. Now, when we have Christians who are getting delivered, we're not driving demons out of their human spirit because the Holy Spirit's already dwelling there. We're driving them out of some part of the soul or out of their body. On the other hand, if it's happening evangelistically, we could be driving them out of the human spirit. Um, deliverance could also deal with afflicting spirits, which are spirits specifically that deal with um, physical maladies and infirmities. And demons don't leave on their own. They must be driven out. So inner healing or the healing of memories, all of these things, sozo, deals with soul wounds, Again, whether in the emotions or the memory. 
When evil spirits are entrenched and don't leave readily, we might utilize inner healing or healing of memories or sozo as a means of undermining them, of kind of digging the foundations out from underneath them. Jesus addresses this kind of in an oblique way in the 24th chapter of Matthew, verse 28, and also in Luke 17, 37, when he said, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. So what is a dead body? Well, we tend to call that flesh. And so when people have wounds in their memories, when they have wounds in their, uh, in their, in their emotions, um, all of this is fallen flesh. And the, the Greek word there is sarx, S-A-R-X. It's actually a chi in Greek, but for what we're doing, X is close enough. So the Greek word is sarx. And when we talk about sarx, we don't always mean physical, like the meat on your bones. We might mean the carnal, fleshly, fallen nature of a human being on the inside. Things like anger or lust, things like drunkenness or lying or you know, things of this nature that Paul describes in his letters. So evil spirits might gather like vultures gather to, to uh, a dead body. Evil spirits might attach to the fallen sarks that needs to be healed through inner healing. So if they don't come out easily, we may engage in inner healing to cut the rug out from underneath them, but then we still have to drive the demons out. And the idea that they'll just drift away, float away when we do enough inner healing, this is also a fallacy. It's urban legend, but it's, it's widespread and, and it needs to be corrected. Otherwise, what will end up happening is people will all revert to just doing inner healing. And I'll tell you a story about a good friend of mine who doesn't live in this state, but I was, um, I was at her home with her husband uh, a couple years ago. And she, um, <clears throat> she'd been in a meeting 20 years before. And somebody had given a word about an area of her life where there was some sarks, some fallen uh, flesh or broken flesh. And so she'd gone through some inner healing, but nobody ever drove the demons out. And I was talking with the husband about things, and he mentioned his wife. And he said, you know, she always has this issue. And he said, do you think that could be an evil spirit? I said, it's almost certainly an evil spirit. He said, but she got some inner healing for it 20 years ago. So I said, well, bring her into the office. We're meeting in his office. So she comes in, and we talk about it a little bit. And I said, did you ever get deliverance from that? She goes, no, they just told me that you know, all I needed was inner healing. I said, look me in the eye. And I said, by the way, get the trash can. So they brought the trash can over in front of her. And she looks me in the eye, and I said, I command that spirit. You've been hiding in there 20 years. Come out. And man, she ralphed. But you know what? She got free. She got free. When deliverance is what you need, nothing else will do. No amount of inner healing, no amount of Bible study, no amount of scripture memory, no amount of communion taking, no amount of baptism, none of it will substitute for a good, simple, come out in Jesus' name. All right. Uh, let's summarize it. Sickness caused by demonic influence can affect every aspect of the human being. As we've already noted with the boy, it's, it's generally true. And the opposite is also true. Expelling the demonic presence or influence leads to healing of all of the affected areas. As we've already noted, daimonizomai means demonized. It doesn't define the kind or the quality of the illness or the extent to what, or to what extent the demon has influenced or affected the individual. However, the extent to which the person is demonized uh, becomes clear from the nature of the person's problem. So we don't run into a lot of possession. And if you do run into it, by the way, it's going to be in a non-believer. Uh, a few years ago, many years ago actually now, a friend of mine was working for the police department in Tustin, California. And uh, the Tustin PD was the law enforcement agency that brought in Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, if you remember him. So he was being held in a padded cell at the Tustin PD station. Um, he was being held naked because of the risk that he would use his own clothes to strangle himself. And that particular padded cell is rounded. There is no flat floor. Again, no sharp corners, no edges, nothing you can do. And it's padded so you can't you know, bash your head against the wall. There's a plate of bulletproof glass, and when they bring food in, it's always on a, not a metal 
no, thank you, on a paper plate that they slide through a little slot at the bottom of the doorway. And a friend of mine was working at that time for the Tustin PD. He and I did a lot of deliverance ministry together. He came walking down the cell block. He saw Richard Ramirez in there, and Richard Ramirez saw him. They met eyes uh, through the bulletproof glass, and Richard Ramirez flew backward through the air, re re recoiling from the Holy Spirit within my friend, hits the wall, and of course slides down because everything's rounded, and you know lies there on the floor manifesting. Well, a guy like that, Richard Ramirez, who was a mass murderer, now that guy's possessed, yeah, for sure. But you're probably not going to run into that in a normal church service, so be at peace. <laughs> All right. Here are some other words that we might use in lieu of demonization, because it's not a word we tend to use in modern culture. And by the way, when you do hear it used, it's usually in the popular media, mainstream media, and they'll say, so-and-so was demonizing his opponent, making him out to be a bad person. That's how we use that term in modern culture. That's not good theological language. So here we have a case where modern society does have it, but they use it wrongly, and we have it, and they would disagree with our use of it, so we just have to agree to disagree. But here are some substitute words for demonization. Affliction, oppression, bondage, stronghold. And all of this implies varying degrees of influence in certain areas of a person's life. So it's kind of like a military invasion of a city. Friendly forces may occupy one part of the city while enemy forces occupy another part. The whole point is to end the conflict completely. Here are some examples of uh, demonization from Scripture. We have a deaf and dumb spirit, as we mentioned, in Mark 9, 25. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, I can't remember the verse, I think it's 16, we have a woman who is bent over with, a, with an afflicting spirit or a spirit of infirmity, and it makes, it makes her unable to stand up. And the Scripture says she'd been bent over for 16 years with that spirit. I've seen people set free of exactly that kind of malady when we got rid of the afflicting spirit that was on their back. Are all people who walk, over, walk in a stooped or bent over fashion demonized? No, of course not. But when they are, they are. So you better be ready to deal with it when that's what it is. Um, Luke 13, 11, I had it in my notes, not verse 16, verse 11. Um, and here's another one that's an interesting one, seducing or deceiving spirits. Paul mentions these in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now, there are a lot of these that have gone out into the world. In fact, the book of 2 John talks about how there are many antichrist spirits that have gone out into the world. I think seducing or deceiving spirits are of this kind. And so what might be spirits in this category? Oh, spirits of false doctrine like those that govern Mormonism or the Seventh-day Adventists or the Jehovah's Witnesses. And each of them has its own cluster of false doctrine. But Paul says, in latter times, some will give heed to seducing spirits and to things taught by demons. So I think in the older paradigm, we used to think that we just argued doctrine against doctrine, and we tried to convince people that they were wrong because we were somehow superior debaters. That's actually not the way it works at all. This is a demonic entity that has blinded the mind of the person, and it causes them to be unable to receive truth, and in the inability to receive truth, that demon entrenches and now takes control of their rational faculties. How serious of an issue can this be? Well, about three weeks ago, my wife and I were in Houston, Texas, and a woman came up to me, and um, she, had, she had a series of problems in her body, and she'd been ill for many years, and she was getting worse and worse, more and more debilitated, unable to, to find any relief. She'd been to doctors, and she told me that she'd recently had a, um, a mammogram, and she had found, or the doctor had found, a series of tumors within her, and she, she was going to go in for another uh, mammogram that was a higher quality one and a PET scan, and she said to me, I'm believing that I don't have cancer. Well, this is the kind of language people use when they are hoping, but they don't actually have any certainty. Um, and she said to me, I need to tell you something. She said, uh, 
in the 1990s, I lived in Yorba Linda, California, just down the street from John Wimber's church. I said, oh, interesting. I said, did you attend? She goes, oh, no, no, not at all. She said, I was a Unitarian a Universalist, Unitarian Universalist. That's the name of the denomination. And it's, it's around. I mean, it's, there, there are bigger denominations, but it's a thing. And uh, she's telling me about all this. And I said, so how did you come out of that? She goes, you know, I don't know. Um, people, my friends were sharing with me, and they showed me things out of the Bible, and eventually I decided that they were probably right and the Unitarians were wrong. And so I, I left the Unitarian Church, and I became a, you know, a, a regular Christian. She said, but I was married in the Unitarian Church, and I raised all my children in the Unitarian Church. I said, hmm. I said, when did all these health problems start with you? Oh, I don't know. It was probably not too long after I left Unitarianism. Hmm. Okay, I said, give me your hands. She gives me her hands, and I said, I want you to repeat after me. I renounce the spirit of Unitarianism and Universalism. Now, Universalism is its own doctrine. Unitarianism is a different doctrine. Unitarianism is that Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit are all one being. Now, they are all one substance. That's Nicene Orthodoxy, as we call it. But they are not all one person. The right way to, to express the Trinity is one God, one substance, one divine God substance, eternally manifested or revealed to us as three persons. So the Unitarians collapse them all into one person. Uh, the other one is uh, universalism, that everybody will be, will be saved. Nobody will go to hell. And so these are doctrines of demons. So I said, I want you to, to repeat after me, I renounce uh, Unitarianism. I renounce Unitarianism, which is the belief that, they're, that all of the persons in the Godhead are one person. And she couldn't even get it out before she started coughing and hacking and choking. And so somebody ran and got a trash can. And, uh, and then I said, and I renounce Universalism, the belief that all will be saved, whether or not they've accepted Jesus. And she couldn't get that one out at all. And she, her knees buckle, and she falls to the ground. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command the spirits of Unitarianism and Universalism, come out. And Anne, it was loud and proud. Anne is nodding her head. And it, it went on for a few minutes. She was coughing and hacking and retching, and she's kind of on the ground with her hands around the trash can. But this was all coming out. This is not the first time I've run into this. I drove these spirits out of a woman in Australia some years ago, and word went all through the city. I showed up a few days later at a, uh, what was meant to be a big intercession meeting, and the leader of that meeting walks up to me and she says, everybody in town is talking about that woman you delivered of Unitarianism the other night at the, such and such a church. And I said, well, you know, the interesting thing is in the immediate aftermath of it, she was completely healed of all of her food allergies. Her gluten intolerance, her spastic colon, uh, her inability to eat soy, her inability to eat chocolate, seafood, all of it went, and she's now totally healed of that. So these evil spirits, they may start with something doctrinal, but they can have multiple points of attachment and multiple problems that they cause in people. By the way, why do you think food allergies have exploded in American society in the last decade? I'll tell you why. It's because we've walked away from the Lord and people are embracing a syncretistic lifestyle in which they take on false teachings that are promulgated by demons, whether they're coming from, I don't know, the Hindu temple, the Muslim faith, wherever they're getting this stuff. They, they think it's all okay to be doing Reiki. They think it's okay to be engaging in yoga, which is Hinduism. Whatever it is, they're mixing all that stuff up. And with that, the protection that God promises in the book of Deuteronomy over our bread bowl, over what we eat, that is being lifted. It's like losing herd immunity. And so when I was a kid, and this would be true for a lot of you that are a little bit older, who, who did you know who had a food allergy? Nobody had food allergies. We just ate the food that we had. Now everybody has a food allergy, and I'm telling you it's because of syncretism, and that is coming about because of the doctrine of demons, false teaching. There's another whole cluster of demons called false prophecy and yet another one called false apostleship, but we don't have time to go into all that, so we'll just stay with the false teaching for now. So Christians can be demonized on these various levels, and even though they're believers, they have these afflictions that the enemy wants to render within them. 
Now, Paul mentions, as I've said before, some of these works of the flesh. They need to be dealt with by repentance and self-discipline. We need to forsake them. If they're not dealt with, they will eventually become demonic inroads and from there, demonic strongholds. That's how people become wrapped up in all of that. And so depending on the nature of the problem, confession and repentance of known sin, false religious or spiritist involvement is important for the one who is undergoing deliverance ministry to receive freedom from their demonization. Demons are expelled by a command to come out in Jesus' name. That's the language that Jesus used, come out. It's the language that Paul used when he delivered the slave girl in, uh, in um, Philippi. And th there, are, there are a couple of substitute terms. They mean the same thing, get out and leave now. So when I'm driving demons out, I might move back and forth between all three. But this, please, Mr. Demon, if you come out, I'll give you a cookie. This is not deliverance ministry. This is bargaining with the devil, and you will get into trouble. If necessary, you can command demons to identify themselves, but don't get into a big bargaining session. If you need the name of the demon to gain control of it, as Jesus did in Mark 5, dealing with the man in the graveyard, go ahead and do that. A lot of times, though, you may not need to do it because the Lord will often, at least in my experience, give you words of knowledge about the names of the demons you need to call out, and when you call them out by their name, they will be more responsive. It's an understood factor in the Bible that when, uh, when you know the name of something, you gain a measure of authority or control over it. So this is why, if you need to do it, Ask the demon its name and command it out by that name. Um, be aware that demons will try to be evasive at times. They'll try to hide. Uh, they'll try to make you think they've left when they haven't. So it's always helpful to operate when you can with others around who can pray with you as a team. Now, I will say this. One of the things people often ask is, how do I know that the evil spirit has left? And there is a, there's a phenomenon that if you were to, if you were to uh, plot a chart with an X and a Y axis, if you were to plot that chart where the, the Y axis is plotting the level of power or the level of manifestation, and the X axis is plotting time elapsed, what, what happens is, as a spirit begins to manifest and it's going to be driven out, it will start at whatever state it does and there'll be a curve. It might be sloped more gently, it might be very steep, but whatever, there's a curve as that demon manifests, and sooner or later, you're going to hit the top of that curve. In calculus, this is known as the inflection point. You'll hit the inflection point, and one of two things is going to happen. Only one of two things. Two and only two. There is not three. The first option is it will go over the edge and off the cliff, and the power curve will drop because that demon left. That's what you're looking for. That's the desired outcome, and generally, that'll be what goes on. But sometimes that demon won't leave. Maybe you lose confidence or you haven't exactly got on target with it. Maybe your authority is waning. You're kind of dealing with what they did in Mark 9. But you hit that top of the curve, you hit the inflection point, and you come back down the power curve, which is to say the level of manifestation drops, and in vernacular, the demon goes back down the hole. And so you didn't actually drive it out. So people always say to me, how do you know that the demon left? And the answer is because you hit the inflection point and you went off the back side of the cliff. You, you hit the other side of the power curve. So let me illustrate. I don't have a demon. I'm just making this up, but this is what it looks like. Did you see it go over the peak and the, power, the back end of the power curve? Okay. When you don't have that effect, it looks more like this. That's rolling back down the slope. So now that you've seen me mimic it, when you see it in real life, you'll know, and you can instantly say, that demon left. Or it didn't leave, we've got to command it again. Or it's attached to something, we need to do some inner healing, or repentance of sin, or you know, whatever that other stuff is that we've been talking about, that's how we're going to get it out. All right. Um, we don't want to become demon seekers, but honestly, you don't need to be. If you're walking in the Holy Spirit and you're doing any kind of ministry, they'll just, they'll just flush like a cubby of quail. And this being uh, 
Central California. I know you guys know what that means because people hunt quail up here. All right. Um, I think that's all I want to say about this tonight. Um, I'll take a couple questions and we're going to pray. So any questions over here? Here. Here. Yes. Bloom Hearts Battle is what it's called. Where can I find Amazon? I didn't see it. Maybe it's out of print now. But you didn't find it on Amazon, huh? That's interesting. No, no, it's, you're misspelling it. That's why you didn't get it. It's, it's a German name, B-L-U-M, uh, I think it's H-A-R-D-T, I'm pretty sure it's Bloomheart. Yeah, here it is, right here, it just came up, Bloomheart's Battle. B-L-U-M-H-A-R-D-T, apostrophe S, Battle, and uh, it's available for sale on Amazon by Frank S. Bloomheart, subtitle, A Conflict with Satan, and uh, they say they have it in paperback, but it's sold out at the moment. And I don't know if they have it in Kindle or not. But anyway, there it is. So that's what it's called. I can show you a picture of it if you want. Yes. I do it. My wife does it. My daughter does it. <laughs> well, my Orbis prayer room, we've got a bunch of deliverance ministers who are not afraid to engage with evil spirits. So that's a place you can find it. Um, honestly, there's a lot of really bad teaching on deliverance out there. It's not grounded in Scripture. This is why when I'm teaching on this, I'm saying, here's the verse. You know, look it up. Let's read it together. It takes longer to do, but there's something about the Word of God. It's living. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And when I teach it from the Word of God, it has a kind of a cut to it. It has a kind of pungency and power to it that, I mean, I'd like to think I'm a compelling speaker, but, but I'm not that good. I'm not that good. The Word of God is living and active. And many people that are teaching deliverance are barely even in the scriptures at all. And so they don't really understand the dynamics of what goes on. That's why you get ridiculous, stupid teachings like quiet deliverance, self-deliverance, and more. And if you would just read the Bible, you, you, would, not, you would not have that going on. So where are you going to find deliverance ministers who think the right way? Um, in the vineyard, there are some who still practice deliverance. There are many who no longer do, but in the, there are some who do it. Um, so you could maybe look at some vineyard churches, but I, I'll be careful to say not all of them would be doing this. Um, so you'd need to find one that's actually practicing it. I know where you live. I'm not sure if the vineyard in your city does or not, but you might ask Ray. He, he might know the pastor up there and, and be able to answer that question. Um, I mean, Catherine Crick seem, seemingly has no issues with doing it. Um, the guy in Tennessee uh, who made the movie come out in Jesus' name, he apparently has no issues with it. And there, there is a growing body of people who are practicing deliverance because they realize they simply must. Otherwise, their churches are never going to grow. Their people are going to remain stunted in their spiritual growth. Uh, they may fall away etc. And so they're just of necessity starting to wade into it. But sitting here right now, I, I know one person in your town that I think, no, no, I do know more than one. I know two or three, but not more than that, who might be able to get it done. Um, and that's outside of the Vineyard Church. So again, if it's, if it's available through the Vineyard there, then it might work. Um, but there's, I don't know a ton of them in your town who could do this. And if you asked me about, say, Klamath Falls, Oregon, I wouldn't even know who to recommend. doesn't mean they aren't there. I just don't know who they are. So there's a need for us to, I don't know, build a network of people who know each other and who know that 
they minister effectively and trustworthy and confidently. But, but here's the reality. This, this idea that demons are going to attack your family because you're doing deliverance ministry, this is just what the enemy does to sow fear to keep people from doing it. So that, that's not going to happen. It, it's just, it's, it, I've been doing this for years, and I think I've had three or four instances in all those years of any kind of meaningful counterattack. Otherwise, I keep my armor on. I remind myself of who I am in Christ. I'm confident in that because I take the word of God at face value. And with that, demons are afraid of me. And I, I'm not saying that to brag or sound like I'm arrogant, but, I mean, one day Beth sent me down to Ralph's to go pick up some food, and I walked into the grocery store, and, and as I was going down the fruit aisle to pick up some fruit, this person was there, and they looked at me and they said, where did you come from? We don't like you. Leave now. I mean, they just manifested right in the middle of the grocery store. So, but that's because I just don't, I, I, I'm not worried about all that. It's like, if they bring the fight to me, I'll give them a fight. And, and they're going to lose. What's that? No, because I wasn't sure that person was ready to get delivered. But what I did say is, I said, you back up and don't harass me. And the person just, we had another time, and this is a funny story, we were sitting in Miami on South Beach, and I was with a couple classmates from my doctoral program, and I was, uh, there were six of us, and there's a lot of homeless people that wander up and down the beach. By the way, not all homeless are demonized, but a disproportionately high percentage of them are. So we're sitting there, we're having dinner at a TGI Fridays on South Beach, out in the open air. And this guy walks up to us, and he zeroes in on the woman who is across the table from me, who is an Egyptian believer. And he made a very lewd gesture, and he started manifesting. And I looked at the, at the guy, and I pointed at him, and I said, you either leave now, or I'm driving you out. And he went, ah, and he ran away. <laughs> it was just like that. And uh, my classmate says, why is it that every time I'm with you, this happens? <laughs> I don't know. It's my lot in life. But anyway, don't be afraid of demons. They are afraid of you. Okay, um, all the way in the back, Robert. Perfect. Yep. Sometimes I do that too. Um, you can ask for the Holy Spirit to do it. Or here's another one. Angels are sent to serve those who are uh, heirs of eternal life. That's what it says right in the first, first chapter of Hebrews. So when I get into a hard situation, sometimes I'll say, Lord, would you give us a couple of angels to help us out here? Now, I may never see them, but I will tell you things shift really rapidly when you pray that prayer. So don't hesitate to use it. Remember, we're not worshiping angels. We're just asking for their help. It says angels came and strengthened even Jesus when he was in his temptation in the wilderness after Satan had tempted him three times. So the Bible takes the existence of angels seriously. You can as well. Again, that's not standard evangelical fare either, but it doesn't mean it's not true. There was another hand up. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Is that no, it's not normal. What it means is that said deliverance minister needs some deliverance. <laughs> and, uh, and more than likely what's going on is whatever the issue is in the intended person who was supposed to be getting the deliverance, their issues are this person's issues. And so as this is going on, there's a kind of a symbiosis effect uh, but but that I would consider that a failed deliverance because it's not expected that the deliverance minister is going to start manifesting demons. I mean, it could happen, and most people do need some amount of deliverance at some point in their lives. So uh, there's no shame in saying, I got deliverance or I need deliverance. But by the time you're ministering deliverance to another person, the expected outcome is not that you yourself are getting delivered as part of the deal. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, that one's simple. You can drive demons out of um, non-believers, but what you do immediately afterward, and when I say immediately, you should take that in the absolute most literal sense you possibly can. I don't mean take a potty break. I don't mean go get a cup of coffee and come back in five minutes. I mean immediately after they cough those demons out or, or sneeze them out or however they're coming out, retch them out, immediately at that moment, you say something like this, Jesus just set you free of evil spirits. You know his power. Give your life to him now. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Most of us are not comfortable doing this. And it's because we've been trained through many decades of American backsliding in our country. Don't preach the gospel. You don't want to force your ideas on anybody. You don't want to be that person who's pushing your views on them. You don't want to shove the Bible down their throat, do you? And we've all been told that. We've been told in the media. We've been told in Sunday school. We've been told we have to be nice. We have to nice people into the kingdom. But when power encounter is going on and demons have just come out, this is not your time to be nice like a standard white bread church. What you need to do is say what Paul said, now is the time, now is the day of salvation. Give your life to Jesus at this moment. I'm calling you to do it, and I'm urging you to do it for your own good. Because if you don't, those demons that just left, each of them will come back and bring seven worse. They'll be stronger and more wicked, and so you won't be eight times worse, the one that left plus seven new ones. You'll be something beyond that, because all of these new seven are more evil, more powerful, more wicked, and they will work their evil within you, you're going to be hosed. I'm using a nice word because I'm in the pulpit, but you, this, you do not want this to happen to you. And that really needs to be your conversation. Most of us are very uncomfortable doing that because most of us have lost our evangelistic edge. We've lost our skill set. We don't even know how to preach the gospel with the intention of bringing someone to faith. We don't know how to have those basic conversations with people about the Lord. But I'll tell you something, every person in the sound of my voice, every single person in the sound of my voice is going to have to redevelop that skill set because if we're going to have this great revival and it's already started, we're going to need laborers for the harvest. So you, whether you like it or not, whether you ever wanted to be an evangelist or not, I am telling you by the word of the Lord, you are going to learn to win people to Christ. You're going to do it. You may not become Billy Graham, but you'll win your two or three or five or ten to the Lord. It's the, it's the only way it's going to happen. But if you've come out of a standard church in America today, when was the last time in a standard church, if you, if you go to one, I mean, if you go to one like this, it could be a different answer. But if you go to a standard church in America, just look at the kinds of things they put on those signs in front of them or that they're advertising. Who's even talking about how to win the lost? They don't even believe the lost are lost. Why would you need to evangelize? Does that make sense? This is the state of the church today. Where do you think all those people that are saved in this revival are going to plug into? Churches like this one and new churches that get planted out of churches like this one. Yeah, well, you go to multiple services, you'll find new buildings, there'll be house churches that will spring up in homes or apartments or whatever. Um, but yeah, there'll be, there'll be new churches that have to form, and existing churches will grow. Not always, not always. Well, God didn't do it that way. God yeah, it, yeah. Sometimes, but but if you look carefully, for example, at the story of Mary Magdalene, let's just talk about her. It says he drove seven demons out of her, but she also hung around him for a while. It wasn't because they were having an affair. That's what the other side wants to say. She hung around him for a while. Why? Because she was going through inner healing. He was restoring her soul in the wake of the deliverance. 
He was teaching her how to live a healthy lifestyle. He was getting ready to return her to mainstream society. But she kind of came along and, you know, just being around him was healing and there would have been probably some evenings when the ministry was done where maybe he'd maybe he'd pull Thaddeus along and say, hey, let's pray for Mary tonight. And so she'd get some more ministry. And it wouldn't necessarily have been deliverance ministry. It would have been all this other stuff. So um, I, think it's, I think it's implied in the ministry of Jesus. But the gospel writers were so taken, so blown away by the deliverance that he did because everybody knew there were demons. That father knew that there were demons. That's why he came seeking Jesus' help. The, the mother of the, of the little girl, the Syrophoenician woman, uh, when he goes on vacation up in Lebanon, um, you know, she knew that her little daughter had an evil spirit. People knew what evil spirits were. And I'll tell you something. In America today, we're very blind to the, to the manifestations that are going on all around us. All around us. You know, many, as I said, of the homeless people that are out on the street, they're manifesting nearly continuously. Not every homeless person, but a lot of them are. And we look at it and they say, well, we're just crazy. They're just crazy. No, they're not just crazy. They're demonized. And so... Um, we have been desensitized, but you go to countries like Syria, you go to countries like Iraq or Lebanon, or if you get into the Arab parts of Israel, Israeli Jews tend to be pretty educated and secularized on the whole, so it wouldn't be true of them, but Arab uh, Israelis, man, they, they all know there's evil spirits everywhere. I'm heading to Jordan in, when am I going? The end of August and the first part of September, and, man, everybody in Jordan knows that there are, in Arabic, they call them jinn. They don't call them evil spirits. But jinn is the word we get genies from. So genies are evil spirits. By the way, Allah, uh, when Muhammad received the revelation of the Quran, he said that he had an appearance from a jinn. Well, there you go. Doctrine of demons. And we've got a whole world religion that's opposed to our faith because of it. So, you know, there's a remarkable consistency to these things when you start to understand them in the proper framework and context. But anyway, back to your question. So there are times of great anointing where we don't need to go through all the inner healing. We don't need to go through all of the... Uh, well, we might need sin confession. That might be necessary. But the Spirit of God will just hit the room and the whole thing will just explode and people are getting delivered. And we saw a lot of this in the early years of the vineyard. Lonnie Frisbee had a lot of this go on. Um, there are people who seem to carry that. With me, it kind of comes and goes. Sometimes it's, I've, I've had it in my meetings, and it's, it's epic, and you walk out of there going, wow, what just happened? But it's not something that happens all the time, and I'm never fully sure, you know, am I being a slacker in my own spirituality? <clears throat> was I in a church, maybe, where there was enough unbelief that they didn't really want to receive that kind of a visitation? Remember, Jesus had a problem with that. Mark 6, 5, Jesus could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief, so he healed only a few sick people. So is it, is it maybe them instead of me? I don't know. Uh, maybe sometimes God's just not doing that. Or maybe it's a relatively cleaner church and we don't have as many demons to drive out in that setting. So there could be many different explanations for why it's not always on. Yes? Yep. I don't think how the kids are trying to figure out either of those things. Do you have a recording or a book on how you would do it or how you encourage that person? I do have recordings on that. I didn't bring any of them because I didn't know we would end up here. But um, if you want to pick up one of the MP3 cards on evangelism and discipleship, it's on there. You can download those messages directly from my website if you prefer to do it that way. Or you can order CDs uh, if you want to do that, and Brian will ship them out on Monday. So, yes, we have that. And in addition, in Orvis School of Ministry, in, uh, it'll be early February when we release our evangelism and discipleship course. Uh, my friend Chris Ledesma and I are going to jointly teach on evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism is the leading edge, get them saved. Discipleship is the back end of it, get them trained up, get them grounded in the Word, how to you know, clean them up, get all the kind of basic processes of Christian living going in their life. Because if you've got a raw convert, not somebody who's just been sitting in a pew for 20 years, they won't have any idea what it even means to live the Christian life. 
And I've been telling all of our students, even if you were thinking of taking a semester off, I really want to encourage you, exhort you, admonish you, plead with you, please sign up for this evangelism and discipleship class at the first of the year. And I would say that to all of you. Please go to orbissm.com. Right now it's not even posted because we haven't filmed it. We're going to film it in July, and then we usually release roughly six months later, thus February of 24. But what this does is it gives you fair warning that it's coming. It allows you to cut back on your consumption of Starbucks enough to pay for it, and, um, and you will learn how to win people to the Lord, how to disciple them and ground them, and we need to be training up an army to be able to do that in addition to this. So please sign up, all of you. And by the way, Ray, I'll just tell you wherever you went. Yeah, Ray, we are now offering a church licensing program. So if you wanted to get the entire of the University Vineyard on board, you can do it at a deeply discounted price. You just got to get in touch with my team and we'll take care of you. All right, yes, sir. I studied that book um, years ago, and I actually think it's pretty good. Yeah, um, it's a little bit dated now. It was written by James. Yeah, yeah, but it, but, but in general, I think it's a, it's a sound way of opening an evangelistic conversation. Again, for a lot of us, our biggest problem is we don't know how to steer a conversation into evangelism. We talked about this with some of the youth this afternoon when I had the session with them. But our skills have gone soft. Kennedy, James Kennedy, who was the pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida, he was a real soul winner. And so he wrote that manual and trained his evangelism teams using it. And I think that might have been the first book that I ever read on here's how you do it. So I think it's, I, I think it's very good. Okay. Yeah. Heartily endorse. All right, are we done? I didn't see it. Wait, wait. Oh. Yes, they do. And so, you know, I was talking about this aspect of the will with inner healing. Here's the issue. A lot of times people who are demonized don't want to be free. And here's why. Demons give people power. And oftentimes, they like the power demons give them, and they are unsure that they want to let go of that. It could be power for self-protection. One of the first really major deliverances I ever had occurred in Hong Kong with a guy who called himself Eddie. That wasn't his real name, but it, that was his anglicized name. He was a member of the Triad Street Gang, and... Um, they didn't use guns because the way the British government was running Hong Kong at that time, guns were not easy to come by. Now, I suppose a few got smuggled in because this is the way it always works, but, but generally guns were not available. So when those gangs would fight, when they would rumble, they would go out on the street and they would be fighting over drug territory. And in this case, we're talking about the, the opium trade and a little bit of heroin, but mainly opium in those years. It was the 1980s. And, um, and as gangs do here in Fresno, they fight over territory. Only now here they're dealing with what, crystal meth or whatever. I don't know. We've got a police officer here or a sheriff. Yeah. Okay, fentanyl. Sure. So this is the kind of stuff they're fighting over here. But back then it was the opium trade in Hong Kong. Well, this guy, a missionary, brought him to the meeting to get him delivered because he didn't know how to cast demons out of, the, out of this guy. And so this little Eddie, he was shorter than I am, but he was built like a fire plug. And he, I said to him, how do you know you have a demon? And he looked at me like, you idiot. He said, I invited it in. So I said, well, why would you invite it in? And again, he looked at me like, you idiot. He said, I did it because it protects me when my gang gets in a fight. I said, well, what does it do? He said, it makes me impervious to injury. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, when we bring out our swords or our 
baseball bats to the rumble. Somebody can slice me, chop at me with a sword, and the blade will shatter and splinter. If it's a baseball bat, it'll simply crack and break, and I will be unharmed, unbruised. And I was like, I don't know if I believe this or not, because I was, I was a lot greener it was some years ago. And I had a friend with me who was about 6'3", 250 in weight, and I, I told Eddie to sit down in the chair, and my friend had never driven demons out. I had done it, but, but as I say, this was one of my first like major, like really powerful demon experiences. And so I said, hey, do you want to take this one, Terry? And he says, yeah. I said, he goes, what do I do? I said, mm, you're pretty tall, probably easier to look him in the eye. Why don't you get down on your knees in front of him? So this Eddie is sitting in the chair, and Terry is down between his legs on the floor looking up at him. And he goes, now what do I do? And I said, I'm, I'm still kind of dubious in my own mind. I said, say this, if there's a Chinese fighting spirit here, I command you to manifest. <laughs> as soon as he said it, this guy's neck, I'm not exaggerating, his biceps, like they're bigger than my thighs. His thighs, it was like watching, you know, a transformer or something, <laughs> literally. He jumps up, Terry's still on his knees in front of him, and he goes, and Terry looks at me and goes, I'm about to die. <laughs> well, this is when you're going to know if you know your authority, and it's one of my sayings I didn't use tonight. If you know your authority, they know you know your authority. But if you don't know your authority, they know you don't know, so you better know, you know? <laughs> so Eddie's like, what? And he's about, and, and you know, he's just at the right height. He's literally about to do a full roundhouse kick and probably take his head off, literally break his head off at the stalk of the neck. And he's like, he looks like the Hulk. And I just stepped in and I said, sit down, like that. And he into the chair, and he's like that. And I said, you come out of him right now. There was no inner healing with that. Out he came. So afterward, this kind of reminds me of that line in out of Top Gun when Maverick and Goose get into trouble in the first Top Gun movie. He's like, thanks a lot. I really appreciate that, Ken. And that's kind of what Terry said to me afterward. But, but anyway, he lived to tell the tale. And, uh, and Eddie got born again and baptized that night. And he came to the meetings the next day as a new believer and started on the process of discipleship. Oh, yeah, he had a lot of things to confess. Sure, absolutely. But anyway, my point in telling this story is that, um, is that with, with a situation like that one, there can be cases where people want the power the demon gives them. He wanted that demon. He invited it in. And there was another time, this is maybe a while back at the Vineyard Anaheim, but we had a guy come and he had a seducing spirit. And what he would do is he would go to the supermarket about 5 o'clock every afternoon, and he would stand there in the fruit and vegetable section, kind of like me with my guy at Ralph's. Uh, but he would stand there, and he would pretend to be looking at the fruits and vegetables, but what he was really doing was checking out the women. And when he would see one that he thought he wanted to take home and go to bed with, he would just look at her, and he would kind of cock his head like that, and she would just look him in the eye, and he'd go like that, and she would go right out the door, and he'd go right out the door, and they'd go back to his place. He was, he was sleeping with 250 women a year, different women a year, using the power that seducing spirit gave him. And he came for prayer, and I said to him, you're going to have to be willing to give up this power that it gives you to seduce women. He goes, well, I don't know if I want to do that. And I said, then I can't help you. I said, I'm not even going to try to pray for you. He goes, well, can't you do anything? He goes, pray something. I said, all right. I put my hand on him, and I said, Jesus, do anything you must to bring his will into alignment with yours. About two weeks later, he called me, and he was in a frenzy. He was in a panic, because what happened was a succubus spirit started visiting him and raping him in the night. 
legit. And so he's freaked out. When he came back this time, he's like, I'll get rid of the seducing spirit. I'll do anything just as long as that stops. And so we got rid of the succubus and we got rid of the seducing spirit. He went on to become a, you know, ex acceptable, respectable disciple of the Lord. I told him, I cannot violate your will. God doesn't violate our free will. Because he wanted to get free of something that was bothering him, but it didn't bother him so much that he was willing to get rid of the very thing that was causing the problem. Well, he didn't know he had a spirit like that, but he did know he had a spirit like that because no, none of his friends were having that kind of success getting lucky. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just talking about it the way we normally do in a you know, conversation. But that's what was really going on. So a lot of times people have a certain amount of pain or discomfort or whatever in their life, and they want that to go away. But when you tell them, well, to lose that, you've got to lose that, they're like, ah, uh, I didn't know that was going to be the case. I'll tell you another one that, that, that is, again, this could turn into a messy conversation, but yoga. People would rather give up their Jesus than give up their yoga. And they make all kinds of excuses. Well, it's Christian yoga. It's holy yoga. There is no such thing as holy yoga. Talk to people from India, and they will tell you uh, yoga is Hinduism. And it's not just any Hinduism. It, all of these yoga poses are prayer postures to Hindu gods that open you up so that those gods will fill you. Those spirits will fill you. And so people who are doing yoga are getting demonized. And when you try to bring that up in most Christian circles today, people are like, I'm not giving up my yoga. I can do Jesus and yoga. No, you can't. Not really. Not get away with it. No. And eventually, it's going to come home to haunt you. But what do people want? They want a hot body. They want maybe flexibility. And some people say, well, I'm doing it because of the pain I have in my back or whatever. And strangely enough, when people stop doing the yoga, usually the pain all clears up because the devil's rules are this. You either pay now or you pay later. But if you pay later, you're paying at credit card interest rates. So if people are trying to use something that's demonic or not acceptable in the mind of God, if they're trying to do something like that in order to solve a problem, the devil might help them in the short term, but out here there's going to be an even higher price to pay. And that price is you've opened a gateway and demons will be infesting you. And that is truth. It's not popular truth, and I often get a lot of pushback from people when I say it, but it doesn't change it that it's true. So again, we have to kind of realign some things and get people thinking about things the right way. Yes, that's a problem. No crystals are allowed. <clears throat> it's all new age. It's all Reiki energy. It's the way it is. You know, in the Old Testament, the Lord said, you're not to have their idols, you're to break them up, burn them in the fire, chop them into pieces, break down their altars. No, we don't have any altars to break down around here. Well, you do if you go up on top of mountains these days. They're building altars in those little rock cairns that are, they're building, but that didn't used to be a thing. That's a relatively modern phenomenon. But that was the command of the Lord. What could we learn from that? That we should make no partnership with evil and we should make no partnership with foreign gods. So you're not allowed to be a Hindu Christian. I mean, you could be a, somebody who was a Hindu who becomes a Christian, but you can't practice Hinduism and Christianity without getting yourself into serious complications spiritually. And you will end up demonized. And I could give many other examples of that, but, but that's one that's so obvious and so prominent in our culture that it doesn't really need a lot of additional explanation. Yes, back there. Exactly correct. Yeah. So most of these Eastern thought systems, yoga and acupuncture, are both in this camp, even though acupuncture is Chinese and yoga is Indian, so they're not, they're not even out of the same culture. But most of those Eastern thought systems um, rely on something that the Chinese call the power of the key. And the way you spell that is Q-I. 
And so you might remember from the Star Wars movies that uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi's early mentor was a man named Qui-Gong Jinn. Well, Qui-Gong is referring to the power of the Qi, and of course the whole Jedi mind trick and all the things they do, m much of that is that very Eastern power and energy field. And Jinn is the word for genie. So Qi-Gong Jinn means... It's kind of a mixed word. It's got some Arabic in it, and it's got some Chinese in it. But if you strip all that out and reduce it to kind of conversational English, what it's saying is the energy field demon. That was the name of Obi-Wan's mentor. This is all true. I'm not, I'm not making this up, and this isn't urban legend. And so for people that are getting involved in acupuncture, acupressure, um, what are some of the other things that people do? What's the... The, the foot therapy, shiatsu, reflexology, um, any of that sort of thing, somehow the power of the key is involved. And people get involved in that, they're almost certainly going to end up demonized. And they are usually going to end up with worse conditions over time. They're, whatever it is they're trying to fix, their sciatica, uh, you know, their sore neck, whatever, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And everybody in America is doing this. Everybody's going after it. And it's like, well, my, my pastor has a Cairo, or every Christian I know has a Cairo, so it must be okay, right? Well, here's what Isaiah had to say about that. As many as, no, it was Jeremiah, as many as are your towns, so are your gods, O Israel. Do I need to elaborate on that, or is the obvious implication clear? Every town in Israel had its own God in addition to Yahweh. That's what Jeremiah said. And Isaiah said a little bit earlier, but with the same idea, and so you have bowed down to all the gods of the nations around you under every spreading tree. And Hosea, who was a contemporary of Isaiah, he said, you have offered yourself to foreign gods as a woman does to a man. Well, that's pretty graphic, but that's what Hosea had to say about that. That is the American church right now. And if they're, they might be into meditation, they might be into Reiki, they might be into yoga, but whatever it is they're into, they might be into chiropractic, and I made a comment, I think it was yesterday, about chiropractic comes out of spiritualism and necromancy, and Donald David Palmer had a demon appear to him in a seance and give him the keys to chiropractic. And virtually every Christian I know is like, well, I have my chiro, and uh, it's okay, right? And if you tell them you probably shouldn't be using chiropractic, they're like, well, what am I supposed to do? How about getting healed using divine healing, real divine healing? I mean, this is just the world we live in. I didn't plan to be here, and we're way over time, but you're raising the questions. And it, it, but it shows you, even in conservative Fresno County, in a town like Fresno, California, where there's still some vestige of Christianity left, and there's still some vestige of church life, you couldn't even have this conversation in Los Angeles County. But it shows you how pervasive the syncretism of our day has become. 